Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody, both in the hearing room and who uh, might be following uh, this hearing on the live stream. Welcome to the second day of the Public Hearing 25, dealing with the operation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, for First Nations people with disability in remote and very remote communities. Uh, I shall ask uh, Commissioner <coughs> Mason to make the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. What a, we acknowledge the Yarrata people as the original inhabitants of the lands on which we are gathered today, Mabantua, also known as Alice Springs. We acknowledge their ongoing spiritual and cultural connection to Mabantua. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their enduring connection to land, sky, seas and waterways. Finally, we pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today who are following this public hearing online, on the mainland and on the islands, including the Torres Strait especially elders, parents, young people and children. So, Walter Judah with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Yes, Ms. Turok. Um, good morning, Commissioners. Our first witness today is Emily. Emily has provided a statement for this public hearing, and that's dated the 24th of June, 2022. The statement is in hearing bundle A, tab 15, and annexures to Emily's statement are at hearing bundle A, tabs 16 to 18. Emily has already taken an affirmation prior to giving evidence. Thank you very much. Emily, uh, on behalf of all three commissioners, I would like to thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission in Alice Springs today to give your evidence. We're very grateful to you for the statement that you have provided. We have all read that uh, statement and uh, we have found it to be very helpful. So we appreciate your coming today and to add to your statement with uh, your evidence in this uh, hearing. So thank you very much. I will now ask Ms. Durago, who will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Commissioners, I'll also indicate that Ms. Lauren Lai of the Office of the uh, Solicitor Assisting, who has come to know Emily, uh, will be supporting in, in verbalising her responses for the purpose of the transcript. Thank you very much and welcome to the Royal Commission. Thank you, Chair. So thank you for joining us today, Em. Uh, you're a First Nations woman with ties to uh, Far North Queensland. Em is nodding. And you grew up most of your life in Mount Isa before moving to Tennant Creek. Emma's nodding. Um, you're also a mum. And em you've got three. Sorry. Emma's nodding. And you've got three grown children. Emma's nodding. And uh, you live in Tennant Creek with your partner in a one bedroom flat. Emma's nodding. Um, in 2003, you had a stroke, and as a result, you're unable to speak. Emma's nodding. And that was about when you were 25 or 26 years old. Emma's nodding. In Tennant Creek, when the NDIS first came to town, um, they had an office. Emma's nodding. And you found that office was easy to access. You could visit it whenever you wanted to. Emma's nodding. Um, but since then, they don't have an office anymore. Emma's shaking her head. And 
<clears throat> to be able to go in to speak to someone from the NDIS, you have to go to the Centrelink office. I miss nodding. And in Tennant Creek, the Centrelink office is really difficult to get the scooter into. M is nodding. And because of that, you have to use a walking stick to get up to the office. M is nodding. Um, your electric scooter, uh, that's how you get around town. M is nodding. And uh, your flat where you live is too small for the scooter to go in. M is nodding. So in order to charge it, you have to park it outside and run a cable from inside through a window. M is nodding. But sometimes you get worried that someone might steal your scooter. M is nodding. And is that because that's happened to other people in Tennant Creek? M is nodding. It makes you worry a bit. M is nodding. You've got an NDIS plan that um, is used to support you and you've got some money allocated in that plan, but um, you haven't had anyone recently sit down with you and explain exactly what's in the plan and how you can use that money. M is nodding. Would you like someone to sit down with you and show you on paper your plan? M is nodding. And would you also like to make choices about the things that your plan is useful? M is nodding. Do you feel like they take time to communicate with you about your plan? They do? Do you feel like they need to be better at communicating with you? M is nodding. And is that because you want to be able to make the choices? M is nodding. With your scooter, is it really important to have one that suits the conditions of Tennant Creek for the road? In the past, you have been given a scooter that wasn't right for the roads on Tennant Creek. Is that right? M is nodding. And is that because the tires get damaged quickly? M is nodding. And sometimes they're not the right design and some people might have had accidents on it? M is nodding. Does it make you worry that if you don't have the right scooter for you, that you might have an accident on it? M is nodding. And is it important for the NDIA to know what it's like to live in Tennant Creek so that they know what scooters suit Tennant Creek. M is nodding. Do you think they know that right now? Yes? Okay. I'm going to ask the operator to bring up a video of you crossing the Barclay Highway, which is the big highway that runs through Tennant Creek. Operator, uh, could you display doc ID IND.0156.0 
So we just had a look at that video um, and you can see the roads in Tennant Creek. Is that the side of the road in the main street of Tennant Creek or is that somewhere else? Um, so the video that we just saw, is that on the Barclay Highway? It's the main street in Tennant Creek. The main street. And is it uneven? So it, it is uneven in some parts. M is nodding. So if the tires are not in good condition, people might have accidents. M is nodding. And in that main street, are there a lot of trucks that travel through Tennant Creek? M is nodding. And do they slow down to the right speed all the time? M is shaking her head. So if your scooter is not in good condition and there's a truck coming, that's really dangerous. M is nodding. But should the NDIS understand that as well? And how dangerous it can be on the main street? M is nodding. Now, M, I want to talk about utensils. Um, you've worked with your OT and together you found some utensils that would make your life more independent and that you could do things on your own. M is nodding. Have you been waiting a long time for those utensils? M is nodding. And some of those utensils include a tip kettle, special plates and cutlery, a non-slip placemat and a meal preparation board. Does that sound right? M is nodding. And you're really excited to get those things. M is nodding. And you manage as best as you can now, but it would change your life to be able to have things that you can use independently. M is nodding. I also want to talk about community access. Are there a lot of shops for clothes and things like that in Tennant Creek? No. So the closest town, oh, it's expensive. So it's expensive in Tennant Creek for the stores that they have there. M is nodding. And the closest township, major township, is Alice Springs. M is nodding. And there's a lot more variety in Alice Springs for clothes. M is nodding. And the prices might be better. M is nodding. Now, do you get to come to Alice Springs very often? M is shaking her head. So um, when you need new clothes or shoes, have you had to get some friends that might have helped you to get new shoes? Did you recently have a friend went to go and get a pair of shoes and it wasn't a very good experience, was it? M is nodding. Um, you FaceTime to be able to pick which shoes you might like. M is nodding. But in the end, they were the wrong size. M is nodding. So it made it really difficult to be so far away and be able to pick a pair of shoes, for example. M is nodding. So is it important, <clears throat> is it important to you to be able to come to Alice Springs to pick clothes and shoes that you might need? M is nodding. Now, looking to the future, is there um, 
there's things that you would like to see changed about or that people should know about living in Tennant Creek and having a disability? And there's nodding. Oh. Do you think that since the NDIS has started that things have gotten worse? Emma's nodding. So before that, you had better supports? Emma's nodding. Do you think that there needs to be greater transparency about plans? Emma's nodding. And you'd like to know how to use your plan and someone to take time to explain it to you. And is nodding. Do you think that government needs to understand that one size doesn't fit all? And is nodding. And that the NDIA needs to understand what it's like to live in remote communities. And is nodding. Do you think they also need to understand Aboriginal people? Emma's nodding. And that there might be different cultural things or responsibilities that Aboriginal people have with their family? Emma's nodding. Do you think the NDIA needs to train service providers on how to be culturally understanding? Emma's nodding. And do you think that for yourself and other people that might also have health issues, that there needs to be a holistic approach for health and disability? Emma is nodding. And today you would like the commissioners to know that one size doesn't fit all. Emma is nodding. Thank you, Em. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much. I'll just, if you don't mind, ask uh, my, the commissioners who are sitting on the at the table with me if they have any questions. And first, I shall ask Commissioner Mason. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I just wanted to know um, how how long it's been since you've been back to your hometown in Queensland. Has it been a long time or a, or has it been a short time? Or has it been a long time? Yes. And there's nothing. And so that means you're not seeing your country and your family. And there's nothing. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that that's been your experience, but I know how important that is, even for the sorry business. Being able to go back. Is that is that does that happen with you not being able to go back in for sorry business? Emma's nodding. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Internet Creek, uh, it was a place that the NDIS first started in Australia, one of the places where it first started. Um, and, and I wanted to know about other people in Tennant Creek who have to use a scooter or a wheelchair. Do you know if there's lots of people with disabilities who use scooters or wheelchairs in Tennant Creek? Emma's nodding. So there's a lot of people. Emma's nodding. So um, would, you, would it be your thoughts that because of that, there should be some way of making sure Wheelchairs are working well in Tennant Creek. And there's nodding. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for working with us in the Royal Commission to be here today. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Commissioner McKeown. Um, thank you. I have one question. Thank you, Emily, for your evidence. When you said earlier that you believe there needs to be a holistic approach with health and NDIS, I understood that to mean uh, doctors and hospitals and nurses and all those who work in health need to understand disability better. Is that right? Emma's nodding. No, th thank you. <clears throat> Emily, thank you very much. And uh, 
as Commissioner Mason has said, and Commissioner McEwen, we very much appreciate your coming to the Royal Commission today and telling us about your experiences, not just about the scooter, but a number of other things as well. And uh, we will very carefully take into account what you have told us, which is very helpful. So thank you so much for coming to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Uh, Chair, we'll need a 10 minute adjournment to reconfigure the room. How long would you like? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. It's now nearly 25 past 10 central time. We'll resume at 10.35. Now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Mr. Griffin. Commissioners, I call Beth Walker to give evidence. Ms. Walker is in the witness area. Can I indicate that Pursuant to our request, she provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 1st of June 2022, which for identification purposes is STAT.0550.0001 is to be found in hearing bundle A at tab seven. And the annexures to Ms. Walker's statement are adhering bundle A tabs eight to 16. Chair, my understanding is that Ms. Walker will make an affirmation. Thank you very much. And Ms. Walker, thank you for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence and for assisting the Royal Commission once again. I know that uh, you were present uh, remotely, I think, at the round table that we, uh, we held recently. So thank you for joining us uh, yet again. Uh, and uh, thank you too for the very detailed statement that you have provided, which each of us has, of course, read very carefully. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate who was supposed to be somewhere. She's oh, there she is, around the corner. Uh, she will administer the affirmation to you. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, Mr. Griffin will now ask you some questions. Ms. Walker, although the commissioners have read your statement in detail, of course, people watching this hearing on the live stream don't have access to it. So can I ask you by way of preliminary, can you describe what the role of the public guardian and trustee of the Northern Territory is? Certainly. Um, uh, adult guardianship uh, is around um, when uh, we're all when we turn 18 we're all um, considered adults and have our own decision making and and our own um, uh, license and, and autonomy um, sometimes um, due to accident um, illness or disability uh, there's there's people in our community who may not be able to to make their own decisions in relation to complex, uh, um, issues and decisions and that's when um, the court or in, in our case the NT Civil and Administrative Tribunal uh, appoints um, a guardian. Now often and, and we strongly encourage for this to be a family member or someone well known to the person um, but um, unfortunately that's not always available and so the public guardian would be appointed as the guardian of last resort. Um, and I'm, I'm privileged to have had that role in the Territory since um, 2016, uh, have an office uh, and a team of people who are delegated officers to work with people. Um, we aim to use a supported decision-making model uh, wherever possible, but at times there's complex situations that um, are, are challenging to deal with. And your position is what's known as a statutory position. And do I understand that 
you've been reappointed to that position and your current appointment will run through to 2026. Yes, that's correct. And as I said, it's a, a privilege for me to um, polite, you know, have that role in our Northern Territory community. How many people does your office act as the sole or joint guardian for? You look, it's approximately 600 um, and it, it does vary um, sort of month to month, but uh, uh, on average around 600 people. At the time you made your statement, you outlined in paragraph 11 the figures as they then existed. And can I take you to that? Yes. That, as you mentioned, a total of about 600 adults at that stage? That's correct. Of which 454 were First Nations people with disability? Yes, also correct. Of those 454, 337 of those First Nations people uh, NDIS participants? Yes, we're involved with about 337 uh, First Nations people involved with, also involved with NDIS. And finally, of that group of 337, 203 of those people live in remote or very remote communities. Yes, correct. Does your office members travel to remote communities frequently? Uh, we, we have a fairly limited travel budget, and so, no, it's, it's not a frequent uh, event for remote community travel to occur. Can I just uh, confirm something that I think follows from paragraph 11? The 203 First Nations people who live in remote or very remote areas, are all 203 NDIS participants? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. How do you obtain information in your office as to the conditions in those communities, given the fact that you have a limited travel capacity? Yeah, look, um, our, our office uh, relies heavily on um, natural networks of, like family, uh, community members, service providers, um, and, and obtaining information from those sources that are close to the person um, in terms of, of what's happening. Um, obviously, you know, 600 people across the Territory, um, you know, we, we're not um, intimately involved with, with every one of those people on a, a daily or a weekly basis. Uh, it's, there's ebbs and flows and, um, and we, it's critical that we partner with, um, you know, medical clinics, um, um, medical services and, and people that are in that location. In paragraph 13 of your statement, you make a comment that your office is uniquely placed to observe trends, changes and issues relating to the NDIS. On what basis do you say that? The figures that we just ran through in, in paragraph 11 um, demonstrate a, a volume of um, situations and people's lives that, um, that, that we're in, involved with by virtue of, of um, being uh, their adult guardian. And um, I think that uniquely positions us to see uh, the trends that are developing and um, the experience um, that my, the adult guardianship officers and, and myself, uh, the situations that we get involved in advocating around um, mean that we're uniquely positioned um, to comment on this. Uh, Ms Walker, given that you have a limited travel budget, as you said, what are some of the ways that you try and get a sense of what you were just uh, describing in terms of trends and the, uh, the situation with, yeah. the, with the clients? Yeah, absolutely. And look, and, and I should, probably should clarify that um, uh, some of our bigger regional centres like Catherine and Tennant Creek, who we just heard from um, Emily, um, we do regular travel to, to those regional centres, um, but it's the smaller places like Bickerton Island up in, in the islands or some of the rem more remote Central Australian communities where there may be only one or two represented people. I, I also talk about um, what I see as the flow of um, people moving to regional centres to access services 
Um, so so um, that means that we do get to interact and, and, and I guess keep an eye on what's happening for a majority of people. It's just the smaller, more remote communities that might be um, shut off in wet season or, or some of those other um, issues that we experience here in the Territory. Um, ideally, we would have a bigger budget and, and um, be able to do more travel, but we also use um, uh, video conference, which is, is not as um, effective, but and talking with people on, on the ground. Mm. And perhaps an additional question is, do you collaborate with other departments to also try and get a sense of the bigger picture, like health, education, et cetera? Yeah, look, and, and, and that was uh, my comment earlier, that we really need to, to work in a partnership model with, um, you know, sort of anyone that is close to the person, uh, whether it's it's the, the local council services or um, uh, aged care services, the, the medical service, um, in terms of them being aware that we're involved and, and sharing information, and that would flag to us that um, something might not be going well and that we need to um, give some closer attention. Thank you. I assume Ms Walker that your office keeps a separate file in relation to each person who's subject to guardianship? Yes, that's correct. And in that file, would it typically, typically contain records relating to your contact with that person and issues arising from your role? Yes, that's correct. And would that in turn enable you, for example, in dealing with issues involving NDIS, to build up a history for that person of your office officers' dealings with the NDIS on their behalf? Yes, yes, definitely. And is those sorts of records part of what's informed the view you've expressed in your statement? Yes, absolutely. And you've also, I understand, consulted with your colleagues within your office in yes. preparing this statement? Yes, and, and um, unfortunately, um, situations where our usual processes aren't able to address the issues satisfactorily, my team um, will escalate those matters to myself. So um, uh, the more um, complex or difficult to resolve matters I, I probably have been involved with personally. So even with people under guardianship order where you may not have primary responsibility for dealing with them in the more serious matters you would be brought in at some point yes and and look um on the guardianship orders um it names me as a public guardian uh it's a role i take very seriously and and that um I have a, a responsibility um, to, to the people that I've been appointed guardian for, and my team assists me to do that. So they keep me well informed, and I want to be well informed, um, so that we we can be doing the best that we can within the the resources that we have available. I want to take you to some of the trends or issues that you've identified in relation to NDIS. Can I commence by asking, do you understand what the concept of a fin market is? Uh, yes, I have the Beth Walker version of the thin markets. Um, and and um, I was a public guardian when NDIS um, was rolled out. We heard earlier about the Tenon Creek pilot. Uh, we weren't heavily involved with the pilot. Um, but then the subsequent rollout of NDIS in the Northern Territory. Um, I think that it's important to acknowledge that um, we have seen many positive changes in the landscape due to NDIS and, um, and, and that has made a big difference in, in many people's lives. Um, and, but the purpose of the hearing today and what I want to highlight is uh, the things that are not working quite so well. Okay. And thank you for that. Can I take you back to the question about the understanding of a thin market? Oh, yes. Sorry, thin markets. Yeah, look, um, I mean, NDIS is, is very much um, that insurance-based model on a market-based model. Um, and theoretically, 
uh, by funding people's plans uh, that will drive the market and creation of services um, so that people can go and choose the, the best services that they need. Um, it, it's a model and I think particularly in places like the Northern Territory and, and um, top end of WA and, and Queensland, um, particularly where we, we see a high uh, First Nations population, um, and it's difficult for service providers, um, given remote um, uh, distances, there's market failure. And, and thin markets is a term that's probably a step before you have market failure. Um, but essentially what, what we're saying is that um, the market hasn't responded and so people's needs are, are not being fully met um, because of the lack of availability of services. Ms Walker, if we work on an assumption that First Nations people in remote and very remote communities struggle to access a full range of disability support services, what in your experience are the reasons or barriers that prevent that happening? Gosh, it, it, it's a very complex um, issue and, and um, there's definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, but there are a, a range of issues such as availability of housing, uh, availability of land, um, availability of service providers um, to be able to respond to the, the needs of, of First Nations people in remote communities. Let's pause there and explore each of those. The question of housing. Yep. What are the inhibitions in relation to housing in those communities? Um, housing um, in, in remote communities is, is as I, I mentioned, um, complex um, issue. Uh, there, there's um, uh, issues about land ownership and, and, and um, the availability of land um, to, to build um, dwellings. Um, typically, we already see high demand uh, in communities and, and potentially overcrowding um, and also the suitability of, of some, some dwellings. Um, a lot of work's being done in that area. Um, you know, some of the, the Commonwealth housing, um, NT government is, is involved in, in the, those housing issues. But um, there's also been a lot of work around um, um, community and, and First Nations ownership of solutions to those types of housing um, issues and problems. Um, but when we're talking about people with high disability needs, um, there's a, it means that housing um, is a critical issue. So for example, if, um, or, or, you know, even um, access to therapy um, solutions, if um, you're organising um, an allied health um, therapist to, to visit a community, they're not able to stay the night in that community if there's not suitable accommodation for them to stay in that community. So that limits the number of people that they're able to see in a day if they have to travel in and out because of housing. So that's a very simple example of where um, there might be many more people in that community that need to see the allied health therapist but because of housing and accommodation issues, um, there might be a limit for, for how many people they can see in that day. Before we explore that further, can I take you back to the simple question of housing? Yep. If one was unfamiliar with these communities, intuitively you would think that given the part of the world we're in, the availability of land wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> Explain to me why that intuitive reaction is misplaced. Look, there's multiple issues. I mean, the cost of building housing in these remote communities is, is very expensive. Um, building the same equivalent dwelling in um, Melbourne or Sydney would be much cheaper. Um, so there's just the, the, the economics of the building costs. Um, availability of materials and um, um, tradespeople to, to do those types of work. 
um, the, the availability of land, as I, as I touched on, um, often um, it may not be, uh, you know, that there's Commonwealth, um, you know, land, um, there, there's leaseholds, um, you know, with, with um, Aboriginal traditional owners. So, so the issue of land ownership is, is, um, is, is um, complex as well. And, and look, I can't, um, pretend to be across um, <laughs> the issue of of, um, of of land and and the the um, building of dwellings. I know there's a lot of good work that is happening. There's a, a program that that's um, uh, I think it's called Room to Breathe, and that's about adding additional bedrooms or bathrooms or, or ex uh, making uh, existing dwellings more accessible. Um, but that um, benefits people who've already got a house, um, not someone who, who may or may not have a house. So, um, yeah, it, it, it sounds like an easy issue. We're in the Territory, there's lots of space. Um, so why is land an issue? It is a bit counterintuitive. Um, you also mentioned the lack of service providers mm. in those communities. In your experience, is that issue being addressed on the basis of your office dealing with people? Do you have any first-hand knowledge of what is or isn't being doing in that area? Um, look, there are um, some, some very good um, service providers. Um, and I think what we've seen is that the existing providers in, in the space, so um, the councils, the Aboriginal um, medical services uh, and some of the, the local um, uh, community operated services um, are providing um, services. There, there is the complexity of NDIS registration and what NDIS registration entails. Sometimes that can be a deterrent. Um, so, for example, um, an art centre in a community that wants to operate um, some, some art classes for people with, with a disability, there's some registration requirements and that might actually... Uh, be outside of their reach um, and, and I think should be looked at in terms of um, the registration for operating a supported independent living service um, should be different to say an art centre who wants to um, make some accessible art classes in their community and obtain some NDIS funding. So I think that's potentially one of the barriers um, uh, but new service providers um, in those spaces. Um, we have seen some, but it, it's really not sufficient to meet the needs of people. And my observation is that there's not a primary driver or a, a primary agency that is driving the creation of of those types of services. So, um, and pulling those threads together. So what does a community already have in place? There's, yeah, there might be a swimming pool, there might be the art centre. How can we maximise um, those existing, um, you know, operations within a community um, through NDIS for, for um, First Nations people um, in remote settings? If there were a well-established service provider based in Darwin dealing with the whole range of NDAS participants, both First Nations and others, is it safe to assume you could take them to a remote community and they would be able to provide the service at an adequate level? Again, um, a very complex issue and not always the case. Um, I mean, um, there's been a lot of work um, with First Nations people around um, the suitability of service providers and, and, um, and the appropriateness and the cultural safety of service providers. So uh, just picking up a, a national service provider or someone from Darwin and popping them in Tennant Creek is not necessarily going to meet the needs of, of people in that area. In your experience, what are the component 
parts of cultural competency that you would be looking for if you were going to recommend a service provider for someone that you had guardianship of? Again, um, a, a really um, complex question. Um, we're we're um, heavily guided by um, the views of, of people that, that we're uh, representing. Um, and so it's about their level of comfort um, in, and safety in using a service provider. And um, I mean, we um, get feedback um, and, and look at the, the credentials, if you will, um, around um, the, the uh, service providers that, that are in place. So for instance, there's um, very established um, um, Aboriginal controlled organisations um, that provide um, healthcare and disability um, services um, in, in certain settings, so say within Alice Springs and surrounds, um, that if that we would strongly encourage um, and, and welcome, um, you know, them expanding, uh, providing their services. But they've got, um, um, for want of a better term, street cred with the community and with people who use those services, um, and and um, and that makes a very big difference. In trying to obtain constructive feedback about a potential service provider, is there any way you can contact the NDIA and ask for details of their experience of dealing with the provider, if they have any? Uh, not formally. So um, informally, um, you know, they're the types of, I may be able to ask that question. Um, there is also the interface with the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, and and um, uh, I guess we are often involved in, in making um, complaints or, or having concerns. So often uh, my team will be telling me that they, they um, you know, have some concerns or, or might not be recommending um, particular service providers. We also see um, uh, services, I guess, evolve, um, especially when there's people that move around or move changed um, services that they might be working for. So that's another thing that, um, that, that we also look at. I was going to come to the question of complaints later, but let me deal with it now. Mm. What's been your experience of making complaints either to the NDIA or to the Quality and Safeguards Commission on behalf of your clients? Yeah. Um, I, I think um, there's a long way to go in terms of... Um, responsiveness and, and ability um, to, you know, communication around those types of, of issues. Um, I think that one of the, the key points, um, and, and I think it follows on from our earlier speaker to the Commission, that the scheme is very transactional um, and very bureaucratic and can be very difficult to navigate. So even for myself, if I come across information which is extremely concerning in relation, um, you know, to, to so perhaps some fraudulent uh, claiming, finding the right person to lodge your complaint with or um, who you should be talking to can be very difficult at times. And I think that I... I um, speak for everyone involved in the scheme that it is often very difficult to find the right person to talk to to point you in the right direction or help you work out or, or navigate the scheme and and I refer to our earlier speaker um, Emily who who highlighted that issue as well if you were making a complaint about what had happened to a participant in the Northern Territory, to whom would you initially raise that complaint with? Uh, if there were NDIS participant, it would be the, the Quality and Safeguards Commission. And in your experience, is there 
a typical turnaround, firstly by acknowledging the complaint and then providing a substantive answer? Uh, typical is probably probably not. Um, it will vary on, on the seriousness of the complaint um, and the, the level of work involved in investigating that complaint. Um, the, the Commission is a relatively new organisation um, and, and quite um, complex with the different registration um, complaints, um, monitoring restrictive practices and types of things. Um, but I have found that, um, that they are very keen to improve um, what's happening for people, but um, there's often times when we're chasing matters up or it's not clear what has become of it. Um, and, but I, I do see work in that space um, to try and make improvements. Uh, but I think it is a frustration for people um, when there's, there's information and situations that are, are very are concerning for that individual to feel like that there's not um, a timely response and, and good communication. However, that being said, I, I have um, seen some very complex and, and very worthwhile investigations that have taken a bit of time, but have been done very thoroughly and with good um, end results. When you lodge a complaint, is the response usually in writing or do occasionally somebody from the Quality and Safeguards Commission actually ring up and ask? Um, look, and again, this probably goes to my point about the, the bureaucratic nature of the organism <laughs> that we've created in that, um, you know, automatic email responses <coughs> that say, thank you, we've received your complaint and it's complaint number X, Y, Z. Um, yes, you get those. Um, you don't get a particular contact person. You don't get a particular time frame. Um, and should you want to follow that up, um, in all likelihood, you probably have to ring the, the dreaded 1-800 number um, again. Um, when there's active investigation, um, there is more personalised um, interaction. If someone makes a complaint about your office, do you respond by giving them a contact name and number? Um, we actively do a little bit more than just a contact name and, and telephone number, um, but we're much smaller than, than NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission. Um, but, yes, the, the response to complaints is a very important aspect of service delivery. Before I leave the question of dealing with remote communities in the way we've been discussing. When you're dealing with your clients and they speak in language, what do you do within your office to assure yourself that you're understanding what their wishes are? Yeah, look, uh, the Aboriginal interpreter service in the Northern Territory is, is critical. Um, in terms of, of um, bridging that language um, barrier. Um, we still experience, um, you know, issues in that there's um, a high demand for that service. Um, the availability of all the languages um, uh, can, can be um, difficult depending on what else is happening. Um, but we're very grateful that it's available um, and, um, and available to use um, with, with people. Um, you know, we have seen um, the level of interaction of, of people um, increase dramatically when we've used interpreters. Um, and there is a risk um, that if, uh, 
you know, if people can't communicate because of a language barrier um, or, or um, access to interpreters, that um, people misconstrue their level of disability. So the the appear, appearance of the disability can can be greater, um, but what it is is actually a communication and, and language barrier, um, we, which is um, something that that all service providers need to to look at to overcome. So is it a fair summary that if a participant is dealing with your office and you have the access to interpreter services, the quality of that interaction, that communication is improved immeasurably? Yes, that's correct. And is that primarily for obvious reasons, including the chance of miscommunication is reduced? Yes, absolutely, because um, sometimes um, people's um, functional understanding of English um, might be um, reasonable, but when you're dealing with, with um, abstract issues like guardianship um, or medical treatment or um, talking about service providers or people's experience, uh, it gets more challenging um, to, to um, be able to use a language. And, and often people, um, English is their, their third, fourth, fifth language um, because they've um, got their their um, First Nations um, languages. If you're trying to explain some concept, cons, a concept or complexity about, for example, guardianship, how does your office satisfy itself that the person understands what's being explained to them? Again, um, we've put a lot of effort into trying to look at, at um, you know, the use of interpreters, um, you know, some, some information in easy English. Um, we've got um, some, some information that's been translated. Um, and, and, but sometimes you're doing the best that you can in the circumstances. Um, but I think it's about the, the effort and the, and the goodwill. You know, I have a strong commitment to making information about guardianship available to people. Um, we've got a road to go on that. but. Um, yeah, there, there, there are ways of, of doing that, but the ways of doing it usually uh, involve um, um, specialist expertise, um, resourcing, um, and, and the um, concept of co-design and, and uh, testing with, with the consumer group who are going to be the end users of those products are all uh, resource intensive. Ms. Walker, this might seem like a very simple proposition, but does your office, in effect, say to people you're explaining something to, can you tell me in your own words what you understood I just explained? Yeah, look, that's a, um, I guess that's a strategy that um, most professionals will, will, will use. Um, and in other settings, it's, it's a way of checking in that, have has what I've been talking about um, been understood? Um, so yes, that's that's a fairly standard um, tool. Um, this is not a question; it's really ultimately a matter of submission. But I suggest to you that that's not as commonly done as you might imagine. I think, unfortunately, you're correct. Yes. Can I take you to paragraph ninety-two of your statement when you talk about <laughs> cultural consultants? This is in the context of supported decision-making services. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the commissioners why you engage consultants in relation to cultural matters and what benefit you see from doing that? Absolutely. Um, the cultural consultants or brokers or, or whatever title um, that, that one wants to give them um, have a greater understanding of um, First Nations um, culture. Um, and I would liken it to, to the use of a guide. Um, so someone who's able to, um, um, 
I guess, be an intermediary um, and help with some of that um, understanding and, and um, you know, even the language that's being used. Um, the reality is that, um, you know, I, I'm not uh, a First Nations um, Australian, so I have a different lens to, to um, someone who, who is uh, a First Nations Australian. And so the brokers um, or the, the, the guide um, have the ability to, to understand that lens or have that lens themselves. And that's been demonstrated in the Territory um, to have some really good results. So um, Aboriginal mental health workers are a good example where um, um, Aboriginal people um, are utilised to um, assist people uh, with their, their mental um, illness journey. So that, that's uh, similar to what we're, we're talking about. I mean, um, <coughs> the... Um, Commission heard about, um, you know, uh, the different um, deaths signing um, across um, territory communities. So that's a good example of where um, some specialist expertise is required um, to help overcome that um, communication barrier um, in terms of those, those different um, First Nations sign languages. I think you're referring particularly to the evidence of Jodie Ann Barney. Mm. And you know, Miss Barney has her own business as a mm. specialist consultant. I take it from your answer that you're also referring to utilising the services of people that work in other areas but have those skills. Yeah, that's correct. And, and we, in a number of instances, have actually utilised um, Jodie Barney's um, services and there's a, there's um, also some um, First Nations psychologists and and um, professionals like that who are able to assist um, in in um, working through the issues. So sometimes it's even um, uh, just about um, unpacking, you know, where the person. Um, thinks that they might like to live, um, understanding um, the money story around um, public trustee. Um, so so that's, that can um, really be useful to have someone uh, explaining that to the person in a way that they understand. And that uh, Ms Walker, is it, is it your view that the Northern Territory government recognises the importance of cultural a broker that you've described in terms of across the Northern Territory government system? And secondly, do you, have there been research to show positive outcomes from that arrangement? Yeah, look, um, obviously um, different areas within the Northern Territory government um, have have different needs. So um, somewhere like um, Department of Planning and Infrastructure would not have as high a need of these types of things as, say, Department of Health, um, you know, or some of the, the, the human services types departments. Um, but I think that um, within the territory um, that generally there's acknowledgement that the cultural um, competence, cultural safety, um, ability to meet the needs of, of First Nations people is a really important area and it's not a one-size-fits-all um, and, and that the best um, way to source that expertise is, is through um, First Nations people themselves. Um, but we have in the Territory seen a number of initi initiatives, the Aboriginal Mental Health Worker Initiative, um, Primary um, Healthcare Network has, has um, done um, some work as well. Um, the Aboriginal Medical Services play a, a critical role in terms of accessibility and information and improving the health of um, First Nations people in the Territory. Uh, I don't think that we've necessarily 
um, cracked the code and found the solution, but I think there's a strong commitment um, um, to, to um, working collaboratively and, and um, uh, making sure that, that it's First Nations um, people who are finding or, or collaboratively working on solutions. Um, and I think that um, that's an area that, that NDIS and the scheme needs to improve in. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms Walker, I think in paragraph 94 of your statement, um, you summarise some of the things you've been saying. For the purposes of those listening into this hearing, you say the use of a cultural consultant and advisor ensures that a participant's experience of the NDIS is culturally safe, optimising the participant's engagement with the NDIS and the outcomes they're able to achieve. And then you go on to make a recommendation. And that recommendation that participants should be entitled to receive sufficient funding for cultural consultants or advisors. Is that based upon your first-hand experience of that need? Absolutely, yes. With your examination of the plans of people you're responsible for, is that raised in any of the plans that you've seen as a need that the NDIS should consider funding? The, there isn't a specific line item within the NDIS um, pricing guide that covers um, cultural advisors or brokers specifically. Uh, what we've had to do is, is um, choose, because we're using our choice and control, um, for some of the other line items um, to be used for those purposes. Um, no, that, that's assume. what we've had to do. Um, and I think the key message uh, in terms of the, the cultural advisors and brokers and return to country, um, it would be nice to see a culture change within NDIS where that is viewed as reasonable and necessary and that you don't have to fight tooth and nail um, to have these things included in people's plans and that the question should be really be, um, you know, at the start of would this person like, would there be a benefit for having a cultural advisor or return to country visits um, and that it's not approached in a punitive kind of fashion where you have to fight to have those things included in plans. Could I raise perhaps a more fundamental issue that arises out of what you've just said? What you've just said assumes that the NDIS, the NDIA as the agency, uh, are capable of making that cultural change that you've just referred to. When I read, read and read your statement, um, you make some fairly cogent criticisms of mm. the operation of the NDIS. Paragraph 23, the choice between providers that deliver basic services in remote and very remote communities is marginal or non-existent. 24, the staff of service providers may speak English as a second language. Difficulties arise when these staff members work with First Nations people who also do not speak English. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 25, the principle of choice and control cannot be realised practically in these settings where the market for disability services is thin or does not exist. 26, as the result of the lack of appropriate services, First Nations people with complex disability needs often have no choice but to move away from country, causing new issues such as grief associated with disconnection from culture, kin, community and country. Paragraph 35, in my view, your office's issues in relation to SIL funding arise because there's a fundamental lack of options in the housing and supported accommodation market. Paragraph 78. Um, the significant, disadvantage, significant disadvantages accrue to NDIS participants who do not have access to an advocate. This is particularly the case for many First Nations people with disability in remote communities because of the complexity of the NDIS system plans and processes, 
the technolo technology and digital literacy required to navigate the scheme, language barriers, multiple stakeholders involved, for example, NDIA planners, support coordinators and service providers and so on. I'm sorry for that to be so long, but I think these are very valuable <laughs> and interesting comments and I'm going to ask you about where they lead. Mm. You've also said just now that communications require specialist expertise, uh, they require resources, they require co-design with First Nations people. You've pointed out that you, no doubt, along with uh, me and uh, Commissioner McEwen, are not First Nations people, so we may have a different lens to First Nations people. My question is, is the NDIS as a scheme, and this involves no criticism of the NDIA, capable of adaptation to achieve the goals that you perceive are important for First Nations people with disability in remote and very remote areas? Is this a case that as well-intentioned as the suggestions may be, it's effectively putting a Band-Aid on a much more fundamental organic problem that the Band-Aid won't solve? That's a long and deep <laughs> question. Please feel free to take it apart or reject it or ask for clarification. But yeah. it just does seem to me that some of the criticisms you've made, and they, they're not, you're not alone in mm -hmm. that as far as the evidence goes, really lead to a conclusion that something more fundamental is needed. Yes, the, the points, I stand by the points that I, I made yeah, in, not, my, in, not, my, in my, in my statement, um, but I guess that um, uh, there's a lot of good people who are doing good work and that um, even organisations, Commonwealth organisations or government organisations um, can make changes uh, that benefit um, the pe their, their customers and people that are using um, using their their services. Um, I don't think it will be easy. I don't think it necessarily will be a hundred percent. But I do think that there are things that can be done. Um, I mean, you know, I point to the the community connectors um, program that, that very well established organisations like Me Watch and Congress um, have been involved with in terms of getting people access. Um, and and I do also. Um, you know, could put my hand on my heart now and say that every single person that I represent is better off with NDIS now than before there was an NDIS. And so I think that, that the recipe is there, but we need to refine it um, so that so that it, it's giving um, First Nations people um, an equitable um service um, to, the, to the rest. I of should rest make of it clear that nothing in my question was intended to be critical of the NDIA or the people no. who administer the services. I'm talking about structural yes. institutional issues, yes. which in a sense uh, stem from the goals of the NDIS, which are stated in Section 3 of the Act. And you see there that the goals revolve around supporting the independence and social and economic participation of people with disability, uh, providing for uh, choice and control, and so on and so forth. All of those are thoroughly admirable aims, mm. but do they really spit for First Nations people with disability in regional and remote communities? So it may be a question of whether the assumptions upon which the scheme is based recognising that those responsible, including the Productivity Commission, were actually alive to some of the issues we're talking about today, yeah. it may be a question of whether the assumptions underlying the statutory scheme are really apt for the people that we're talking about today. That's a, a very good point. And, and I do think that the the values and, and of the scheme um, still hold true but I think in some ways the implementation and the approach, um, you know, that's evolving 
uh, perhaps by cost pressures, um, perhaps uh, by workforce pressures um, and other issues like that, that we're not seeing the, the wholesome implementation of those values and principles um, as fully as I think they could be realised. Thank you. Sorry for that lengthy interruption, um, Mr. Griffin. Mr. Griffin, can I just make a comment? Oh, man. <clears throat> uh, the NDIS uh, came into realisation in the period after we had a national commission for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. We had, and also we had uh, First Peoples Congress. Um, and so in a sense, we're in that post era mm. of not having a national body, which also had regional um, areas of leaders with responsibility. And I, um, in reflecting on the chair's observations from your statement, what in this post period of ATSIC mm. and the First Peoples Congress is that um, particularly at the Commonwealth level, there is no peer leadership um, of, a, um, of, a, of a commission or a body which has that national leadership mm. to guide other national commissions. And therefore, it's been reconstructed over many years um, within sectors. Yes. And therefore, we have the Closing the Gap Agreement, National Agreement, which is agreement between the Commonwealth states and territories with a coalition of peaks. That's a result of being in the post atsic period. Mm. But what I'm listening from you and your statement is that one of the major consequences of that decision is that we don't have local um, representatives who can be peer leaders. Um, and in fact, you know, that co-design process at the beginning of the NDIS, having a peer leader to design that in sense to co-design it, to ensure the interest of First Nations people was central mm. to the benefit of that scheme, um, I, I would say wasn't there to the extent that it would have been if we'd had a national commission Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission. So um, the second observation I may be talking about thin markets is that with the abolishment of ATSEC, those regions then started to understand that they were part, and this is talking about First Nations organisations, not for all, but for some, that they were now part of a competitive tendering process mm. with other non-government organisations around government services. Mm. And so um, if there was going to be a time of um, market growth, that would have been the time mm. as, the, uh, as creating the conditions for this time of the NDIS when we needed those services and we needed those, um, what they needed a workforce, whether they be First Nations or non-Indigenous, working in remote areas and very remote areas, but we don't have that. Mm. And so we know the investment prior to the NDIS and the abolition of ATSIC was investment in remote and very remote communities into First Nations organisations. So we're dealing with a different landscape of bureaucracy mm. where there is no anchor, there's no federal commission to help guide that peer design and conversation and accountability in that mm. sense. It's now coming through individual sectors and leaders. So um, it is very challenging, um, but the elements of what we had prior to uh, that change, um, we still have very much the knowledge base still within the First Nations community control sector. Mm. Um, and we've seen it and we will hear from those leaders this week. Mm -hmm. So um, in a sense, as a nation, we're all grappling with an issue that is not of our making in a sense, but it now becomes our responsibility mm. of how we 
make better decisions. If we know good, we do good decisions. If we know better, we make better decisions. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, the the Aboriginal controlled um, organisations um, uh, are critical in coming up with the solutions and are, I would argue are best placed, that what I'm um, commenting on is my observations um, based on, on the situation of this group of, of um, First Nations people with disability. Um, but the only um, option available to us is partnerships and promoting partnerships and encouraging that type of um, peer leadership and development. And I think uh, I mentioned earlier that there's the lack of a driver and, and that in, in, in could, you know, that potentially could be the driver. But um, I think that there needs to be movement around, um, you know, the issues that are facing First Nations people, um, what, what are the solutions or how do we work towards these solutions? Um, you know, often it, it's, it's not quick. Um, it's concerted effort by, um, by key people um, and, and I would str strongly encourage that and welcome that um, and, and definitely don't um, purport to have... Um, any any ownership on the solutions? I've got some ideas and can contribute, but um, it really needs to be um, those those Aboriginal controlled organisations and community organisations. And and there's um, unique solutions for the different different places. It's a one size fits all approach it has not worked well previously. Thank you. But that's the fundamental problem, isn't it? How you achieve what you've just said and Commissioner Mason has talked about within the context of a so-called insurance scheme and a scheme which depends upon the existence of markets and then must engage in, engage in remedial actions where there are no markets. That's a comment and I won't delay Mr <laughs> Griffin any further at this point. Ms. Walker, the best laid examination plans of mice, men and council assisting <laughs> die on the secular altar of the chair's intervention <laughs> due to its comprehensive nature and conclusionary nature. But in order to just elicit a little bit more information on the transcript, can I just briefly go to some short issues? You refer to your observation that there's been a reduction in SIL funding for many of the participants. Mm -hmm. The gravamen of your criticism of that is it appears that the people don't get any warning that that's likely to happen. Can you just explain to the commissioners briefly what a typical meeting would look like when it's announced that there's going to be a reduction in funding? Absolutely. Um, and I think the key point is that it's often not brought up at the planning meeting. So we're, we're um, for some of our participants, they're potentially into their um, third or even fourth annual plan. Um, you know, COVID has played havoc with um, um, you know, plan reviews and things like that. Um, but we have had um, uh, uh, probably since since the scheme commenced, um, where you attend a planning meeting and you talk about what it is um, that that the person would like, um, and there's often. Um, no warning. Um, so there might be some conversation. We've had examples where the discussion has been around someone with, with too active night shift and the conversation has been about can we reduce the night shift to one passive and one active overnight shift? Um, you know, the, the, one of the aims of the scheme is that we want to be working towards independence and, and so changes in things like that level of support um, when they're done well and when they're considered 
are a way that it can increase someone's independence. We've gotten the plan and um, the person's um, support, which, which was um, two workers to, to, for one person, um, has been cut to one worker to, for that person. Uh, there was no discussion, there was no, no warning, uh, and it's just opening the plan and, and discovering that that was the decision. And I think that's one of the key points that I would like to make, that the rationale and the transparency and, and being able to have a dialogue around why was that daytime funding reduced? It wasn't discussed. It wasn't on the radar. Um, often um, people that are in supported independent living have a range of providers and a complexity of their needs that really should be um, not interfered with without very serious consideration and planning. And, and that's what I see is missing. It must be very difficult if you're in the middle of a meeting and you find out for the first time that these changes are being proposed. Yes, and, and what it is usually is an email with a plan um, and uh, saying we've cut the daytime funding from two to one to one to one. Um, and that's the, the what's been funded in the plan. Um, you've already got service providers who that day are providing two-to-one funding. We often see a delay in the plan, plans being delivered, so by a few weeks to a month. Um, and so there's then the creation of an issue in that a service provider in good faith has been providing two-to-one support um, but there's a backdated plan that's now saying, oh, it's, it's only one-to-one -one support. Um, so it's very difficult and it doesn't leave us much room to move. The centralised um, group within NDIS that make these decisions, I have never, ever spoken to anyone on that team um, to be able to say, can you explain to me why this person's funding has arbitrarily been changed from two to one uh, to one to one with no apparent reason? Isn't the effect of that approach you describe that you drive the participant into the, the review or appeal process because the decision is presented as a fait complete? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and even if things are discussed at a planning meeting, where we have another matter where we have asked for certain things in the planning meeting, which I think are quite reasonable and necessary. We, my office doesn't ask for things that are um, outlandish or, or uh, not or shouldn't be considered reasonable and necessary. Um, we haven't seen the plan yet, but we've been told we didn't get everything that we asked for, um, so, so we should put in a section 100. Now, we physically haven't even seen the plan yet, but yet we're being advised to put in a section 100 uh, review. And do you say that these meetings should be conducted as an open, transparent <laughs> discussion of those issues rather than meetings where it's simply the participant being informed that a decision has been taken. Absolutely. I mean, the earlier example, there was discussion about um, two active night shifts um, and one becoming passive and one becoming active. Um, and, and that was at the table, the players were discussing that. Uh, it was something that people were going to move towards. The, there was no discussion at that planning meeting about the daytime um, staffing ratio and the consequence um, for this person who had significant um, level of disability. And um, the being pushed into that review process, um, so, so if you make a Section 100 um, re review request, the legalistic response that you get doesn't actually give you the reasons for why was that decision made? Why has it been, been dropped in that instance? 
uh, which then potentially pushes you into the AAT um, appeals space. In broad legal terms, instead of the existing plan being the status quo and any change to that plan being required to be explained and defended, it seems like the owner shifts to the participant to try and overturn a decision that's been made without any consultation with them. Yes, and, and look, and I think that goes uh, to the Chair's point about the scheme and my comment about um, that the culture within the organisation uh, needs to be changed, that um, we should be celebrating and pleased uh, when things are going well. Um, and, yes, we should ask the question of, can the supports be reduced? Is this a good time for the supports to be reduced? But it should be the, the person with a disability's um, uh, input and decision and, and um, their supporters and the people around them, um, you know, the behavioural support specialists, the allied um, health practitioners, should have the opportunity to comment on what is the consequences of these decisions because the consequences um, can be very negative and, and very ha have major um, impact for people with disability. And did I understand your previous answer correctly that your office struggles to get an explanation as to why these changes are made? Absolutely. We, we are not provided with any cogent argument of why things have changed or why they've been reduced. Um, and some of the matters that have gone to appeal, um, some of the rationales are based on misinformation. And it's that misinformation that we would like the opportunity to, to correct. For example, we had someone whose SIL funding was reduced. When uh, it came to appeal time, there was some discussion about, well, they've got some informal supports. When we asked, well, what, what informal supports? Um, oh, well, there's an uncle. What they hadn't put together was that the uncle was also an NDIS participant and also resided in a SIL accommodation. And so the informal support that they were talking about was another NDIS participant being um, supported by another organisation. So that's a very good example of where misunderstanding and miscommunication has led to quite a um, negative pathway. Ms. Walker, does it take up a significant amount of your office's resources to seek reviews or to make appeals in this process? A, a great amount of resources. And the uh, adm administrivia <coughs> um, of dealing with NDIS um, takes up a great amount of time. A quick example of that is um, I'm the public guardian. There's delegated offices. Uh, one delegated officer has, has uh, been noted as the contact person. Uh, they've moved on to other opportunities and then someone else contacts um, NDIS and they're told, sorry, I can't give you any information because your name's not written down on, the, on, on this person's um, file or case. So that's a really, really good, clear example where we have to make certain things happen um, and, and explain why we should be um, involved or given information. But you're the guardian. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's... If you're not entitled, who could be? This is the frustration that I think many people experience because the response that you're given is, but that's not the name on the file. Um, Mr. Griffin, can I just ask about the time it takes for your office to prepare this, these documents around an appeal or review? Can you give us a, a sense of that time period that it takes yeah. away from what you would ordinarily be doing? Elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I, I, the, the actual time, um, you know, we haven't quantified, but the, the consternation it causes, the, engage, the phone calls with service providers, um, following up, um, you know, those reviews. The, the AAT appeals um, process, and I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that question, um, there's organisations that are funded by Commonwealth Government um, to assist people with appeals process. Uh, we don't have um, in-house expertise. Um, we just kind of, you know, do the best we can. We, we use the legal service. Um, NT Legal Aid Commission is um, funded um, for um, um, briefing counsel in terms of appeals. Uh, we were advised by them in February that due to the number of uh, requests that they had received, that they had run out of funding um, and that their funding, uh, that they wouldn't take new referrals until 30th of June and it was possibly going to be longer. So uh, we are fortunate that we've got a couple of matters that they are involved with um, and their involvement has been critical. But I think coming back to my point about the scheme, um, this is a really classic example where we can't get answers to pretty basic questions about why has something happened or not happened. We're funneled into this uh, review appeals process, uh, but then the organisations that are funded to assist uh, uh, NDIS participants with their appeals are not being adequately funded. Um, for me, that leads to a really big dilemma because do we go and put the appeal in, which is the ethical and, and moral thing to do, knowing that we've been advised that we're not going to be able to get um, uh, legal, legal help from the, the Legal Aid Commission. Um, and at the end of the day, um, and, and the examples about the supported independent living and the cuts in, in staffing, it, I think that, that um, it's been lost sight of that this is people's lives. We heard from Emily beforehand where the wrong scooter or if she doesn't have access to the scooter and, and the, the cost of clothing, they're the things that really affect people's lives, whether you have two-to-one funding or one-to-one -one funding, um, whether you have um, occupational therapy funded in your plan, a support coordinator. I think what I am seeing as public guardian is the winding back of people's plans and it seems to have a financial driver rather than the needs of the person at the centre of what's happening, and that really concerns me. I understand, uh, Mr Griffin, that there are some logistical constraints that uh, we're under because mm -hmm. of uh, witnesses that uh, are yet to appear. So can I leave it to you to determine how far we go with uh, the, this particular I was going to propose to go for another five or ten minutes with this witness, and then we'll consider whether we can swap the witnesses if the next isn't available and inquiries are being made at the moment. Yeah, sure. You, you go ahead. Um, it seems like the Commonwealth Government or the Northern Territory Government are paying a lot of money in the ways you've described simply because there's not a conversation with a proposal that a plan's going to be altered. 100%. Can I ask you very briefly about support coordinators? In your statement, you indicate that there are some very good support coordinators, but by omission, some that are not so good. Based on your experience, what are the characteristics of an effective support coordinator when dealing with First Nations participants in NDIS? Okay, well, firstly, would be um, the, the level of cultural competence of that support coordinator. And, and sometimes it might, um, you know, be as, as simple as um, that they have spent time working in a remote community. Um, ideally, um, and, and we are seeing um, some in Darwin, 
um, and, and I think that there's a couple in Alice, but um, uh, First Nations um, people who have set up support coordination businesses or um, um, Aboriginal controlled organisations who have entered into that space. Um, Me Watch in, in um, um, East, East Arnhem uh, is one of those organisations where um, uh, the work that we see them do, I believe that they achieve outcomes that, that would not be able to uh, be achieved otherwise. Um, the different skill levels is, is a matter of training and I think that there's, um, there's work that needs to be done around the, the role of support coordinator. Um, but I think, again, back to the scheme and, it, and its genesis, there needs to be an acknowledgement that for some people and for some situations, a large amount of support coordination will be needed. And for some people that will be ongoing. Um, and I don't know that, that the, the NDIA share that view. <coughs> so in your experience, the very good support coordinators dealing with First Nations people in remote communities have a high awareness of the importance of connection to country and a high level of cultural competency. Yes. Why is connection to country, return to country trips important to the people that you're guarding of? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, unfortunately, particularly with people with, with um, higher support needs um, or where their needs are, are not able to be met on, on community, and it may even be a historic fact from um, when they were younger, um, that they've they've been brought into to some of the regional centres, um, and and research history, people's lived experience, um, the importance of connection of, of, of culture, kin, and country just cannot cannot be um, overstated. Um, and, and there's there's people that you'll be talking to that, that will be able to speak about that that much more. But what we see is that that disconnection um, causes more problems. And so um, uh, increased depression, increased problems with mental health, increase with well-being, increase with antisocial or, or problematic um, um, behaviors increases because there's that, I'll use the term grief or loss of those connections. Um, and so I see where we're, we're having to intervene and pay for services that could in fact be less if there was more importance or acknowledgement of the importance of that connection um, to country and, and, and family and culture. Um, and the partnerships with Aboriginal controlled organisations in, in that space and process are critical as well. Does it flow from that answer that even if it makes sense for someone to leave country to receive a specialist disability service, if they stay away from country, their quality of life is more likely not to decline. I'd agree with that statement. Um, and, and people um, from communities do make efforts, um, but with, you know, the recent COVID experience, there's, there's difficulties in, in terms of um, being able to travel to those centres and, and catch up with people. And flowing on from that, you made reference in your statement to the funding of return to country trips or the absence of funding. Explain to the commissioners your experience of endeavouring to have people under your guardianship be able to return to country. Yeah, again, um, we're, in, we're in that space that I would like to see us move out of where um, the... And the NDIA doesn't 
really get the importance of those return to country trips. They're viewed a little bit like a holiday um, rather than um, a cultural um, connection um, that's really important to First Nations people. And again, there's no specific line item in, in the NDIA pricing guide that covers return to country trips. And so we're often trying to manoeuvre around people's day-to-day -day services and pull out little bits or use other areas um, to fund um, the, the return to country um, trip, um, including the participant pays for some um, travel costs um, as well, but the staffing support and, and some of the, um, and, and look, the logistics of some of those trips are extensive. So um, if someone requires um, two people to, to lift them, um, you know, because of their mobility issues, um, showering and those types of things might require specialist um, um, equipment. Um, and so they're, they're often there can be challenges. Um, if they do need to take a charter plane, there's the accessibility um, of the plane um, and, and also, um, you know, if people do need to drive the car trips and things like that. So they're, they're not necessarily easy things to plan depending on the needs of the person. But the benefit and, and the... Um, the joy that you see on, on someone's face of returning and being with family um, is, um, there's really no words to describe that. Would you like to see the pricing guide contain a specific section dealing with as the acknowledgement of the importance of return to country and secondly, the mechanics of how that might be incorporated within the NDIS? I think that would be a good step um, towards the, um, um, you know, the, the, I would love to see First Nations people with the entitlement where, where they're entitled to ask for, you know, some, a couple of trips a year, however frequently or, or, or you know, obviously that would need to be negotiated, but where there's, a view that it's an entitlement, the same with the cultural brokers, that it's not something that that should be extra and special and, and, and that we should have to make a, an enormous effort to obtain, but where it's viewed as just part of the reasonable and necessary um, for First Nations people who have had to move to obtain specialist um, disability services that, that it's, they're entitled to those types of um, return to country trips and, and, um, and the cultural brokers. And so is it moving from a position of having to establish some exceptional circumstances, or to use my word, not yours, manipulating the price guide to one where you think that commissioners should consider creating an entitlement as the first point? and then work from there. Absolutely. Okay, then my questions for witness. Mr Griffin, do we have enough time for commissioners to ask some further questions if they wish? Yes, we do. Thank you. Commissioner Mason. Um, just on that point of return to country, I have heard it being described as a holiday. Um, and as a First Nations person, not with a disability, um, but with family, um, I would describe it as psychosocial wellbeing. Mm. Would that, is that how you would describe it? Yes, ab absolutely. And, um, uh, yeah, the, the importance of that connection to someone's wellbeing um, is, is, is critical. Thank you. Thank you very much for your evidence today. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen. Uh, thank you. I have one more question. <coughs> Ms Walker, at paragraph... 109 of your statement, you make the observation that when Betty had stable living arrangements, that had a positive impact on you know, her sense of well-being and safety. Is it your observation 
of your clients that when they do or if they're able to get secure, stable, accessible, appropriate housing or living arrangement that also has a positive effect on other things in their lives, like community participation, other things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Having somewhere where the person can be located, they're safe, um, you know, basic things like nutrition and medication, um, when those things, those basic needs are being taken care of, then we can move to things like, um, you know, participation in activities, return to country um, kind, kind of, of activities. And we have been in the unfortunate situation where we've had a very, very well-funded package of support, but because the person didn't have a permanent address, the, the support package wasn't able to be activated or, or um, um, commenced. So that that's... Uh, very poor state of affairs. And connected to what you said earlier about where you believe the NDIS has been positive for your client, do you think the NDIS has been flexible with participants being able to transition from inappropriate living arrangement to what they would like to be living in? Yeah, look... <laughs> The issue that there's, um, I'm sure the commissioners are aware that there's some touch points with NDIS and other service systems. So corrections, health, housing, and what, what we see or get told is housing isn't an NDIS problem. Um, and so, But sometimes there's not an awareness of what it means for, for the individual. So I think I've talked often about the package of, um, you know, somewhere to live and support, um, and that's one of the areas alongside corrections and health and some of those other touch points that I think the, the scheme needs to, to uh, be slightly remodelled um, to make sure that we're not, not creating gaps at those spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just have one very specific question. In paragraph 12, uh, you say where you or your office acts as guardian for an NDIS participant. The guardian is not the plan nominee. What are the what's the division of functions then between the guardian and the plan nominee? <laughs> okay. Um, the the term plan nominee and and um, this is the Beth Walker version of the world, um, is basically a construct by NDIS. And so um, I could nominate uh, for Lauren to be my plan nominee to help me manage my plan, but there's no um, legal standing for that plan nominee, whereas um, a, a, with adult guardianship, you've gone through that legal process and there's a guardianship order. So... Um, so we um, work with NDIS and the participant in the role as as of adult guardian, um, not as a plan nominee. Thank you. Um, I assume before Ms. Walker finishes that there's no application from any of the represented parties to ask Ms. Walker any questions. I shall pause briefly <coughs> to see whether there is. There isn't. In that case, Ms. Walker, thank you so much for, again, some really very interesting evidence that you've given and very thought-provoking, uh, both in your statement and the oral evidence today. Uh, we're gr very grateful to you and, uh, if I may say so, for the work that you do in the Northern Territory and your office does on behalf of uh, perhaps uh, some of the least uh, advantaged people in this country. And thank, thank you. you very much for the opportunity. Um, and I think uh, it's important that, um, you know, the two um, case studies of, of Betty and Alan uh, um, have been pivotal um, to, to my evidence and, and that's um, their story. So I would like to acknowledge uh, that and, and thank you for the opportunity and the work that the Commission's doing. Thank you so much.
Mr. Griffin, what do we do now? If we adjourn to 115, we can then have evidence from the MPY Women's Council, and in the interim, we'll further pursue the position of the Namok family. Ah, we haven't, I hope, created an insuperable problem for them. Now, I understand it's just a problem within Cairns of getting them to the location they need I to see. be at, and that's being worked on at the moment. All right, thank you very much. In that case, we'll adjourn until 1.15 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes. Sorry. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The Royal Commission will now hear from Kim Minara, Margaret Smith and Kim McRae from the NPY Women's Council. MPY stands for Nakunjara, Pintinjara, Yakunjara, the three local languages spoken on the NPY lands. The NPY Women's Council is an unorganisation organization led by women's law, authority, and culture. Ms. Smith is a deputy chairperson of that organization, and Ms. McRae is the jungle team leader, team manager, I should say. Just to remind the wider audience, and if the operator could please show the map. The MPY lands is vast country. As you can see on this map, it consists of 25 very remote communities spread across 350,000 square uh, kilometres across Western Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory. The region has a population of about 6,000 people with an average of about 200 people per community. Chair, Ms McRae and Mrs Smith will take affirmations. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I understand that you prefer to be described as Mrs Smith, is that right? Yes, that's the preferred designation? Yes. Very good, okay. Uh, Mrs <coughs> Smith and Ms McRae, thank you very much for uh, coming to the Royal Commission and for the detailed statement that you have provided, uh, which we have all, that is the three commissioners, have read uh, with uh, great interest. Thank you for that and thank you for being prepared to give evidence uh, today. We appreciate the assistance you're providing to the Royal Commission. Can I ask you please to follow the instructions of my associate who is over there and she will administer the affirmations to each of you. Thank you. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please both say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there will please now uh, attend to the questions that will be asked and uh, we shall take your oral evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mrs Smith and Ms McRae, you've provided a joint statement to the Royal Commission dated the 21st of June 2022. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. yes. And they're all, uh, and commissioners for your uh, benefit, that's hearing bundle A, volume one at tab 19. There's also three annexures um, to your statement. The first is your annual report outlining the breadth of your services and support that you uh, provide to your community, and that's at tab B. To give a good to give a good life report, uh, in which there are detailed recommendations, 
and um, commissioners, I draw your attention to pages 43 and 45 in relation to those recommendations at tab 21. So looking after children with disabilities report, and that's at tab 22. And again, commissioners, there are detailed recommendations at pages 51 to 53. Ms. McRae, if I could start with you, does the research underpinning the findings and recommendations of both of those reports um, conducted in a culturally safe and appropriate way? Yes, it was. And does the research um, and findings and recommendations still reflect the desires and needs um, of NPY people living with disability? Yes, it does. Mrs Smith, could you please tell the commissioners or provide an overview of how NPYWC was formed and who its members are? It was formed in 1980. The first program was disability to look after the disability and the aged care. Everybody as a family looking after everybody. So that's how NPY was formed from the members from the NPY region. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And Ms. McRae, could you please just provide a brief overview of NPYWC's work, particularly as it relates to being an NDIS provider? Yep. Um, NPY Women's Council provides a range of um, human services and advocacy for people um, living in the NPY region. Um, our NDIS services are mainly um, support coordination for NDIS participants who choose NPY Women's Council to be their support coordinator. Thank you. Now, I want to start firstly in relation to um, housing shortages and, and poverty. Um, at your statement at 52, you've indicated that poverty is endemic throughout NPY lands. What impact does living in poverty have upon access to the NDIS and disability services? I think that uh, poverty becomes, is, is the kind of biggest issue for people out in communities. When you don't have enough food and shelter and safety, um, engaging with your NDIS plan is just not a priority. Um, so many of our families live in overcrowded housing. Um, they're relying on um, Centrelink benefits and pensions um, for their income. And, uh, yeah, it's often very difficult for people to prioritise uh, the NDIS plan when, yeah, every day is a struggle just to survive. Mrs Smith, did you want to add to that? How does the poverty on NPY lands affect people getting services, disability services? It's a very hard country, you know that yourself, and living is very hard out there. Store price and everything's very high, sky limit. Everything's not cheap in communities, living in communities, looking after your families. People have a lot of demands upon them. Yes. You've said this at your statement. It is our view that the NDIS, and this is paragraph 96, is designed with an inherent assumption built in that all people with disabilities start from a baseline where their basic needs are met each day, that everyone has a moderate level of literacy and access to food and shelter, <coughs> and that a wide range of services are available to all. Ms. McNabb, what uh, paragraph is that? 96, I'm sorry, Chief. Thank you. What impact do these assumptions have on the operation of the NDIS on the lands? Um, the impact is that people with disability often um, don't understand their NDIS plan. They don't have access to going on to the NDIS portal to check their plan. Um, they don't necessarily think that the, the um, supports included in their plan are the most important things for them when they're struggling every day around getting enough food for the family. Um, 
when they're living in overcrowded housing um, and often uh, having uh, obligations to support the extended family, um, it can be very difficult for people to think that the NDIS plan is important or a priority. Mrs Smith, Ms McRae just spoke about getting onto the portal and, and that, of course, involves having technology. Mm -hmm. Do people and people with disability on NPY lands tend to have phones and iPads and computers? No. Nobody uses computers in their house or in, in the community, only in the office and school and youth. That's the only main place to have computers and telephones. Does that make it hard for people with disability connecting to the NDIS? It's very hard. Now, Mrs Smith, I'd like to ask you something else, um, and this is at paragraph 100 of your statement. Um, you talk about having travelled the lands and hearing from your clients and people you support about what they're not happy about with the NDIS. Can you please tell the commissioners some of the things that you hear over and over? Well, the forms that NDIA takes it in to fill in the forms are very hard. Mm -hmm. They can't even do, do it on their own. Somebody else could be doing it on their wishes. Can their family always do it? No. Who helps with they that? They struggle their self families. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand for my brother. Mm -hmm. And you, in, it indicates in your statement that people are saying that it's very complicated, the NDIS. Do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. Now, I might just move on um, to talk about the Jungwoo um, team for a moment. And Ms McRae, I'll direct this at this because you're the manager of that team. Um, could you please tell the commissioners about the Jungwoo te team and the work that they do? Yeah. Um, the Jungu team is the disability and aged care and carers team. Um, so we provide supports to um, older people. We su provide supports to people with disabilities with um, NDIS plans who choose NPY Women's Council. We provide support to people who don't have an NDIS plan um, because we have some advocacy funding. So we're able to um, support those people through advocacy and through our integrated care support services. Um, we get subcontracted to deliver those um, services out on the lands and we're able to um, help carers through ICSS funding. And who funded the uh, jungle team prior to the NDIS rollout? Yep. Um, prior to the NDIS rollout, there was the um, tri-state disability agreement between um, the Northern Territory Government, South Australian Government and Western Australian Government. Um, and that provided uh, case management and flexible respite for people with disability and their families in the NPY region. And how has the introduction of the NDIS affected both your funding and the services that the uh, Jungle team provide to people with disability? Yep. Um, the funding, of course, the, the previous state and territory funding that we received through the tri-state agreement um, ended because funding was being handed over to the Commonwealth for the NDIS. Um, so we lost quite a lot of funding um, to start off with, and it, it's taken um, quite a number of years for us to build um, back up in terms of the amount of funding that we receive. Um, and in terms of providing supports for people with disability, under the previous agreement, under the tri-state agreement, we were able to um, provide much more family-centred supports, um, whereas the NDIS funds um, individuals and it can be difficult to use that funding um, to work with the whole family. Um, so, yeah, it has changed our model quite significantly. I might just um, 
pick up on what you've said there. You've, you've mentioned family-centred um, support delivery. What's the difference um, as NPYWCC between family-centred supports and person-centred supports? Yep. Um, family-centred is, is the way that Arlingu live how in communities. People live in um, family groups and um, people's identity is, is very much centred on um, their family and their um, position in the family. Uh, I think that previously, under the previous funding, we were able to do things in a much more family-centred way, like working with the whole family to build the capacity of the family to continue providing support for people with disability. With individualised funding, um, yeah, it can be quite difficult because that funding is focused on the person with the disability mm -hmm. and not all the people around them. Um, we we work with the families because families provide the care out in community. There are very few services and very few supports in local communities. We acknowledge the role that families play in providing the care and um, we think that we should be able to use the NDIS plan to actually support that whole family to continue providing that care. Mrs Smith, do you agree with what Mr yes. Craig just said? Yes. Did you want to add anything as to why um, supporting the whole family is so important to your people? Family is the number one key in our community. In the Living a Good Life report, Mrs Smith, um, you, you say that um, Anung have clearly said that they want to continue living on traditional country with family and culture. Yeah. And that was one of the key findings of that report. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Do you find that NDIA staff who come to the lands understand this? I'm not sure if they understand. Ms. McRae, what's your observations? Um, I think, yeah, like Margaret, it's, it's pretty difficult. We're not involved in planning meetings and um, it, it's difficult to know um, what they understand. I think that um, plans, the, the goals and plans are starting to improve a little bit and to be a bit more reflective of that. But certainly our previous experience has been that the goals and plans don't reflect um, the need for people to um, stay on country with their families, um, with access to culture and participating in cultural business. I'll come to plans um, in a moment, but before I do, just in relation to, to the two reports that we've just been discussing, have those reports ever been shared with the NDIA? Yes, they have been shared with the NDIA. And has there ever been any meaningful discussion with NPYWC about the contents of the report or the recommendations that are set out in those reports? No, no, there hasn't. Now, I just want to move on to some barriers to accessing the NDIS, and I want to start talking about children first. Um, you've raised some difficulties in your statement about obtaining assessments and diagnosis, um, particularly for children. What are some of the issues that are causing that problem? Um, I think that there, there are some cultural barriers to having assessments done, um, which are related to shame and blame. If a child has a disability, um, sometimes families are concerned that people in the community might blame them or think they did something wrong and that's why that child has that, that issue or disability. Um, there are a lack of practitioners able to provide culturally appropriate assessments or to, to travel out to the lands and provide those assessments. Um, there's the whole issue of families just worried every day about food, shelter and safety. And so 
uh, making the time and having access to the resources um, so they can go and get uh, assessments done, it, it can be a real challenge um, for families out in the lands. If there were providers who were able to, who were permanently on the lands, would that make a difference in terms of obtaining assessments? Uh, yeah, I think it would make a big difference. And I might just ask you, in terms of um, allied health professionals that do come out to do assessments, how often um, would you say uh, those professionals are coming out to do that work? I think it, it varies hugely, but I would think maybe three or four times a year um, the allied health professionals get out onto the lands. And is that just for assessments or does that include um, other disability supports as well? Yeah, that includes other disability supports. Thank you. Mrs Smith, um, I just wanted to ask you a question now in relation to, again, the Children with Disability Report. Um, it says in there that for the most of part that uh, children with disability living on NPY lands are cared for by their families. Yes. Yeah. And the report also says that about a third of the children that were referred to in that report were living off NPY lands. So um, do you know why that is? Because it was hard for the parents to take care of them. Is one of the issues that there's a lack of other services <coughs> at NPY lands? Yes. As well? Yes. And for those children who are not living at home in their community, it, with, with their families, what impact does that have on them not living at home? Well, it brings sad memories to the families also, they're missing them. Because they like to keep an eye on their children, you know. Every mother does that. Yes. You, you can never trust anybody else looking after and caring for your kids with a disability. Do the parents tell and carers and extended family tell you how they feel when their children are not at home with them? Yes. What sort of things do they say? Well, we had a lot of issues at MPY Women's Council. Families ringing us up and families coming into MPY to the office asking for help to get their kids back to the lands and mm. stuff like that. And Ms McRae, uh, some of these children going into out-of-home care, is that right? Correct, Those kids yes. that are not on NPY lands? Yes, Can you tell us a little, uh, tell the commissioners rather a little more about that? Yeah. Um, when, if a child has high support needs, um, they inevitably end up in out of home care in an urban centre. Um, and they, I mean, in some, we've got examples of kids who um, their families actually lose touch with them. They've got no idea where they are or who's looking after them once they go into out of home care because. It's very difficult to maintain contact and um, cultural connection and sometimes those children, um, yeah, lose language. They don't get to necessarily go home and see their family and participate in important cultural activities. Um, yeah, it can have a devastating impact on the child and on the family um, when children have to um, go into out-of-home care. And... You're talking here, are you, about children with disability? That's correct. Now, I might just move on now to talk about plans, the issue that you raised earlier. Now, in your statement, you indicate that NPYWC worked with 119 participants um, and you said to ensure that they had the supports they need, including helping people understand their plans. What were people not understanding about their plans? And I might start with Mrs. Smith. Were people I'll having trouble? Start with Kim. Friend. Start with Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ms. McRae. I think Margaret um, summarised it well when she said people don't understand anything about their plan. It's it's written in English. Um, it's written. Um, it's 
nonsensical to people. People don't know what it is or what it means or how it can help them on a day-to-day basis. Plans are largely inaccessible and incomprehensible to, um, to people out on the lands. And, Mrs Smith, something that's in your statement, um, I could draw the Commissioner's attention to perhaps paragraph 137 and 138 um, and that you've observed some goals in plans not being created by participants themselves. Have you seen that? I've seen it on air about it. Mm. People just go and do the forms they said because no understanding between our number and that staff, whoever's on the land. But you hear that, do you? Yeah. And English is, they talking in their foreign language, not proper English, you know. Mm. Slow English, I don't even understand what they say. So language but, is a barrier yeah, big to barrier. making plans, mm-hmm. making proper plans? Yes, to make a proper plan. Okay. I don't, don't know what they doing or it could be that person who's bringing the form and just ticking everything up from his yes. point of view, not that anonymous point of view. At paragraph 137, I might just read um, this particular goal. Uh, it says this, and this is a goal that was in a plan of one of your clients, I understand, Ms. McRae. Um, I would like support to enable me to make good decisions in my daily life. I will achieve this goal by having a personal mentor who will assist me to make good decisions in my daily life and to build independent skills and abilities. I will be supported by my coordinator of supports to engage a culturally and linguistically appropriate person to assist me. What can you tell us about that goal and the interactions you had with the person whose plan that was in? Yeah, um, that is, that goal is not a goal that she would have set for herself, yeah. Um, Why do you does, say that? She doesn't talk like that. She doesn't think like that. She doesn't actually think that make, her decision-making needs any help or support. She's quite happy about the decisions she makes herself. Um, yeah, uh, that goal was imposed on her and, and it was kind of um, assuming that she, she doesn't have the capacity herself to make decisions and that she needs help with those decisions. Um, and Ms McCready, do you have a conversation with this participant about that particular goal? Um, I haven't directly, but I have known that participant um, for almost 18 years now. So I know her very, very well. And um, that is not something she would ever say or ever think or ever want. I understand. Thank you. Now, just finally on plans, um, if I may, are you finding that cultural activities and supports to stay on country are finding their way into plans, Mrs Smith? Are you seeing that for people on NPY lands, people having cultural supports in their plans? I really don't know. Not sure. Miss McRae? Um, I think that um, the goals in plans are improving. We have seen some improvement recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been dealing with um, the NDIS on the APY lands since 2013. So it's taken a long time um, to, to start putting um, appropriate goals in. Um, but, I mean, one of the difficulties is for people from the lands who are in supported independent living here in Alice Springs or in an urban centre, and whether there is um, funding in their plan for them to return home, um, funding in their plan to take part in funerals and cultural business and um, other really important things that they need to do um, back home on country. And what we're finding is the money is all tied up in people's supported independent living and that there is no um, capacity within the plan for people to return home. And that, that's a big issue. That creates a lot of um, sadness. I was about to ask, what impact is that having on the people that you speak to? Yeah, yeah, definitely. People are, I mean, Margaret's got some family members who are in town um, in that situation, so she might want to talk to this a little bit. 
Margaret, for people who are not living on NPY lands that want to get back and are having trouble doing that with their plans, what, what are they saying to you? What sort of feelings? My nephew and his was both living at Fort Melrose Quarter. His name's Robert and he's been ringing up NPY, NPY, telling me, ring NPY, I want to go back to NPY, move back to NPY. Because he's been asking him and his wife to go home for funerals and sorry business. That's hard for him? No. The people who are caring for them is not listening to them or understanding them. There's no help in it, you know. They have been ignored all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why they've been ringing Kim and Di. I see. Yeah, NPY. So he kept telling me, he's coming to my place every day and telling me, them staffs or workers, it's just ignoring us, you know, not willing to talk to them. Like there's no plan in their plan. There's no plan for them to go back home. I see. Maybe that's the way it is. And Mrs. Smith, this, I also wanted to ask you, you said in your statement that the NDIS is designed for urban areas or cities and not for NPY. Can you talk about that and tell the commissioners more about that? Well, when it was first released, we heard about it because I know the urban people was, you know, wanted really badly that program to go ahead and go the animal people had a lot of issues and worried, you know, because it's, they was all saying, we all were saying, it's not going to fit into our background, you know, our backyard. Mm -hmm. It's not fitting into the remote. Can you tell us some of the reasons why it doesn't fit? Because it wasn't meant for us, you know. It was meant for the urban, the coastal people around the urban area and the centre. We knew where to deal with it. Like, we had our own organisation. We started at 1980s. We thought, you know, we was, now we thought we are going to be safe holding on to our Jungle team, but I don't think so, you know. It's, it's taken our funding away too. Was it working well for people with disability before the NDIS when you yes. were in charge? Yes. We were all families, friends working together. You know, Jungle team had all their staff going out of the community everywhere. Would you agree with that, Ms. McRae? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, definitely. Now, I just wanted to move on. Sorry, can oh, I just yes. ask a question there? Does that mean that the people with disability with whom you typically work are now worse off because of the NDIS? There's more money, so there's much more money out on the lands than there ever was before in people's plans, but um, that money can't be used necessarily in the way that people with disabilities would like to use it. Um, so some people say there were better services before because we were able to be much more family-centred, um, but I acknowledge that there is um, heaps more money out there now. And what then are the problems in utilising the money in the way the people whose plans we're talking about would want the money to be used? Um, it's, I think it's about the way that um, the NDIA interpret the NDIS Act sometimes. I can give you an example. Um, we had some... Uh, a 
some families with children with disability who wanted to come into town and access some blocks of therapy because whenever the therapist had gone out to see them, they'd been away from the community and so they'd kept missing the therapists. We thought, okay, good plan, bring them into town. But when we talked to the NDIA about using the plan to pay for the family, now we could pay for their transport to come into town, but we couldn't pay to accommodate them out of the plan. And the staff member at the NDIA actually said to me, the NDIS does not pay for family holidays. That is not what we do. Um, he missed the point completely. When we bring that family into town for that block of therapy, we accommodate them, we provide three meals a day, we take them out and do a couple of really nice things like going to the movies or going to the football or going to bush bands or whatever's going on. But the focus of that is having them in town where they can get the therapy every day. They're not distracted by what's going on in the community or in their family. They're able to really focus. Um, the parents and primary carers have got a lot more ability to um, to build their own capacity in that environment. And they identified that they would much prefer to come into town and access that therapy than to have the therapist go out to them. How did you or they learn that the NDIA would not permit funds in the plans to be used for the purposes you mentioned, such as accommodation? What What's the decision-making process that uh, applies there? Yeah, we actually called up um, one of the staff from the NDIA to ask the question directly because we don't want to be using funds in a way that's not deemed appropriate. Um, and, yeah, that was how we found out then that we were told very clearly that, that the money could not be used to accommodate the family in town for a week so that they could access a block of therapy and capacity building. And in that particular case, who had authority to approve expenditure from the plan? Um, that's a good question. I guess we assumed when we spoke to the NDIA that they would have the... Because at that stage, the um, children's plans were all um, agency-managed agency um, rather than plan-managed, so it was up to the agency. But is that different if uh, the plans are not managed by the agency? Are there plans, for example, that are self-managed? Um, there's... No, I'm not aware of any self-managed plans out on the lands, but there has been a shift to a lot more people being um, plan managed rather than agency managed. And does that make it, sorry, <laughs> does that make it uh, more feasible to get funding for the purposes you mentioned? Um, it does make things a lot easier in many ways, yes. Sorry. Not at all. Thank you, Chair. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Would it help if there was more flex? It sounds like it, it, you need more flexibility. Absolutely. Much more flexibility in terms of, you know, you get the funding and you can broadly use it within the, you know, what the plan agreement is with that. Yeah, that, that's, you're that's perfect summary. Flexibility is the key to be able to use the plan in the way that's really um responsive to people with disability on the lands. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And indeed, um, Ms McRae, the two strong themes that come through your statement and Mrs Smith are the need for flexibility and a family-centred approach. Is that Are they the two key issues as you see them? Definitely. Mrs yes. Smith, would you agree yes. with that? Yes, yes. Now, before I um, move on to asking you questions about some solutions, I just wanted to talk about two further barriers. Um, and the first one is in relation to negative interactions that Anul people have had um, in the past or presently with government agencies. How does this affect access to the NDIS and services, mainstream services, I should say? Do you want that one, Margaret, or me? Yeah. Um, what it means is that um, because of history, um, 
because of uh, the history of um, children being removed from families on the lands, the stolen generation, um, people have very negative um, experiences of having interaction with mainstream organisations and government organisations. And so they are reluctant to engage because of the, that history and um, that you need to build up a lot of trust um, with people. They need to feel very comfortable um, in your presence and they need to understand um, how you operate and what you're going to do with the information that, you, that they give to you. Mrs Smith, do you hear that as well, that people are worried about kids being taken away? Yeah. You've heard that from people in relation to that? Even me, I could be worried for my kids taken away. And does that also relate to interacting with the NDIA and mainstream services? Yes. Another key barrier that's... Uh, mentioned in your statement is about language or perhaps lack of traditional language. Mm. Mrs Smith, can you talk about how um, language can be a problem in terms of people understanding and engaging with the NDIS? Yes. Yeah. Um, where shall I start? There's a lot of different language groups Staff from going in to do the forms and it's very hard understanding them. Even I can't understand. Have you ever seen any NDIS documents in traditional language? No. Have you ever had NDIS documents explained or, or seen or heard them explained in traditional language? No. Ever? No, not even the interpreter they got, you know, mm -hmm. to explain it. And does that affect how people engage with the NDIS or if they do at all? I think doing the forms and, you know, and with their style of English, nobody can fill out form like that, you know. Do you think people have difficulty understanding because yes. of language? Yes. Now, in t I just move on to talking about some solutions um, that you've proposed, and one of which is building um, a local workforce. What is it going to take to build a local, would it take to build a local wor workforce on NPY lands? Yeah, um, I think that to build a local workforce, um, the NDIS um, pricing at the moment is, is probably one of the barriers. I think that um, local people need um, a lot of support and mentoring um, to be able to um, learn that work and to be able to do that work themselves. We've done some workforce projects where we got some state and territory government funding and we went out and talked to people about the opportunities available through the NDIS. Um, we talked about um, how Arnangu can become support workers and we talked about all the, the range of things that support workers do in the community that it's not just about... Um, doing personal care, um, that support work can be about taking people out to activities that are going on um, and that it's very um, important work and very valued work. So we had quite a lot of people who were interested in doing that work, um, but what we found is that they really needed a lot of support because of the complexity of their lives, because of their family obligations, because of they may have um, health issues themselves, um, there were a lot of barriers to people taking on that work, um, but we believe that uh, that's, in the end, that's going to be the only way for the NDIS to work, for local Aboriginal people to take up the jobs that become available through the NDIS to work with people with disabilities in their own community. But at the moment, the funding is not available to support that. I was going to ask, that was my next question, Ms McRae, is if there was sufficient investment, both in terms of money and time, 
And but actually, Mrs. Smith, I might direct this to you. If there was enough money um, to invest in local people, could you build a local workforce? Yes. To support we can. all people with disability on your yes. lands? Yes. We can build that. When you gave that answer, are you thinking of support within the framework of the existing NDIS or are you thinking no. of a new scheme altogether? The, I know on the land I'm talking about to support them to get that job of them staff. <clears throat> staff that's flying in and out, in and out, wasting government money. The grants people could be doing that, our people could be doing that work. And who who would pay them, do you think? They'd be paid out of the um, NDIS plan to do that work. But they, yeah, there are lots of um, lots of things that would have to be put in place um, for that to happen. They're, we think that um, new workers out on the lands um, need uh, um, almost wraparound support so they can learn how to do that work, so they can manage their, their family obligations and cultural obligations mm -hmm. um, and still provide really good support for people with disability. Um, yeah, we think that uh, that is really the most logical solution to um, supporting people with disabilities stay living on country. But you do see that, I, as I understand your answer, is operating through the present system, which involves providing plan for individuals and then the individuals then determining one way or another how their funding is to be used. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not happening at the moment, which I think th there's a message in that um, and that there need to be new models of um of funding organisations to pro provide the support for the workers to do that work. Um, because I think that out of an individual's plan, there's not necessarily um, adequate or it's not necessarily appropriate to be funding the, the support needed by the worker. I, I hope that made sense. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense because one of the points you make is that there is a fundamental difference between providing support to individuals and the, if you like, the communal way of culture, association with the land and so on. So I'm just wondering whether the logical outcome of your ideas is actually a move away from the individual funding of particular people with disability and something much more adapted to the communities that you describe in your statement. Yeah, that, that does make sense. I'm very glad to hear that. Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah. I just had a question, Ms. McRae. Mm -hmm. uh, we often hear about uh, within the Royal Commission around the social model of disability. And I've heard First Nations people talk about the social model of disability as being a First Nations model of support because uh, that accessibility is done through families in the community. Um, do you think the Aboriginal community controlled sector has a social model and therefore that next step into social model of disability positions are in a very strong position to do this type of leadership. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the capacity for local Aboriginal organisations to take on those roles is definitely the direction that needs to be taken, yeah. You can't bring people in from outside to do that work. Those local organisations know people in the community, they know about culture, they know about language. Um, it just completely makes sense to just work with the local organisations um, to try and develop uh, supports for people with disability. Um, and the second question I had is around uh, some 
uh, people sometimes use the word entrenched or um, they are aspects of community life that cannot be changed or through other uh, outside influences, it impacts on the community, like Mrs Smith was talking about, the cost of prices in the store or the cost of fuel, and that impacts on service delivery. So as a, um, an Aboriginal community control organisation, uh, working with people across the Ngarrawatta, Pitinja, Yungarrawatta region, uh, the organisation has made assumptions about the way that it works with families on the lands. Um, and you've talked about some of those assumptions, which is the significant level of poverty, um, the low income across the board, low educational attainment, cost of living, all of those factors. Um, do you think that those assumptions, that they are not optional, but they actually are um, essential assumptions to make prior to co-design of, of a model because those are intractable issues. They're not changing quickly in, in the, despite everyone's best effort. Yeah. And that applies also to the MDI-S model on, in remote and very remote communities particularly. Yeah, yes, I completely agree with all of that. I think that... Um, that poverty is one of the, the big barriers for people to engage with their plan and to, to get um, the best outcomes from that plan because people are, yeah, they're fully engaged in trying to survive. People are in survival mode all the time and um, that takes them away from thinking about, you know, being in a particular place at a particular time to see a therapist or, yeah, the things that are in their plan just aren't a high priority. I mean, I think if um, if we could address poverty in remote communities, that people would um, benefit uh, much more from their NDIS plans. Thank you. I just have a, a few short questions about the thin market trials for you, Ms. McRae, and then I have one final question um, for Mrs. Smith. Now, Ms. McRae, um, there were two thin market trials that took place on NPY lands. One was the coordinated funding proposal and um, one was direct commissioning trial, which is ongoing. Now, in relation to the coordinated funding proposal, that involved the uh, commissioning of um, 10 assessments for children um, by pooling funds. Now, there is correspondence um, between uh, NDIA and, and NPYWC. How would you describe the quality of NDIA's um, consultation with you in that trial, or your organisation, rather? Yep. Um, I think the quality of consultation with the NPY Women's Council was um, really good. Um, they involved us right from the beginning. Um, they were very supportive and, um, yeah, we, were, we felt very positive going into that um, proposal that it was um, being handled appropriately. But I understand at some point there was a tension. Can you uh, tell the commissioners about that? Yep. Um, the tension came because we... Um, we sought quotes for organisations to go out to the lands and do those assessments. And when the quotes came in, we met with the NDIA thin market team to um, discuss the quotes and make decisions about um, who, which organisation um, we were going to go with to do the assessments. Um, the tension came because... They were very, very focused on the best quote being um, a value for money. So they were very, very interested in basically the cheapest quote. They thought that was um, good value um, and, and the best way to go, whereas we were much more focused on the quote that was culturally appropriate that came from an organisation that had um, significant experience working out on the lands already and had um, really good staff who had lots of um, knowledge about working with Arlingu. Um, so 
yeah, there, there came a point of tension where we felt we were being pushed towards the value for money quote as opposed to the best um, cultural fit. But at the end of the day, um, your preferred provider did those 10 assessments that's great. Um, and as a result, or if you could just confirm, as a result, there were particular support needs identified for each child. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. As far as you know, have those particular supports been followed up or met? No, they haven't. And why is that as far as you know? Um, because th there aren't those supports for um, children aren't available on the lands at the moment. So the assessments were done, but there were no services to actually provide what was that's correct. identified in the reports. Now, in relation to the second um, direct commissioning trial, um, you explained in your statement that there was a significant reduction in participants, um, the funding in plans, is that right? Yes, that, that was one of the things that happened, um, yeah. And how did you address this with the NDIA? Um, we initially sent an email when we realised what was happening. Um, we sent an email to the Thin Market team saying, you know, what's going on here? Um, we wouldn't have participated in this process if we thought it was going to result <coughs> in people automatically losing um, funds out of their plans. Um, can you explain to us what's happened? And... Have you made any inquiries or are you aware as to whether or not those reductions have been rectified? Um, we have made some inquiries, but um, it, it, some in some cases it's unclear whether they've been rectified yet or not. Yes. And just finally, um, and Mrs Smith, this is a question for you. If you were asked to design a model to, ass to assess and deliver services to people with disability on NPY lands, what would that model look like, Mrs Smith? Oregon, Tumor Team, NPY Women's Council with partner with another organisation. So who would lead the model that would assess and deliver the services? NPY Women's Council. And who would ultimately deliver those services to people on your lands with disability? NPY. And do you think that NPYWC has the capacity or could build up the capacity to do that job? With the help of another partner, we can. And would that partner be Aboriginal controlled in your view? Yes. And what do you think that would mean for your people with disability on your lands? It would mean better life for our people and, you know, better achievement and happy people, happy family, happy organisation. <laughs> thank you, Mrs Smith, and thank you, Ms McRae. Is there any questions from the commissioners? Yes, thank you. I'll ask Commissioner McEwen first. Yep. Any questions? No, but thank you very much. Commissioner Mason. I just want to say thank you for your evidence this afternoon um, and working with the Commission. Just be able to hear from you today. Um, and it's been really important to the work of the Royal Commission to hear about the work in the Nalada Pitanjaya Kojara region. Indeed, a very, very remote part of the country. So, thank you very much. In uh, paragraph 45, you say that the Chungu team still supports clients and carers to access the services they need, including the NDIS. That, I, that they, I assume that means the team offers practical help for people, including specialist equipment, bedding and clothing. Mm. Is this a very significant part of your work? Yes. And does that mean that people who might be eligible to participate in the NDIS can come to you and say, please help me fill in the forms and deal with the NDIA so I can get my plan approved? 
Um, we tend to direct people to the organisation that's funded to get people onto the NDIS, but yes, we certainly help and support them um, to get access. And within the uh, lands that you're dealing with, what are the organisations you can refer people to to provide the kind of assistance that they would need to access the NDIS? The health services are funded to help people um, test their eligibility. So it's um, Nanajara Health in WA and Nanapa Health in um, the APY lands. Will they help people fill out the forms as well as do whatever um, diagnostic tests may be necessary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. They, they help with all the requirements. You've said, I think, elsewhere in your statement that a barrier to people um, gaining access to the NDIS is that they find it just too difficult to navigate, don't understand the forms and the bureaucracy. Does that mean that the organisations that help well, don't have the resources to help everybody or that they somehow there's a difficulty in connecting the people who need assistance with the organisations that are providing assistance? I'm just wondering why these organisations would not ease the path for people to the end. I think they have eased the path quite significantly, particularly on the APY lands. Um, but I think that, um, I mean, we've got examples of um, people with disability who basically run away every time the NDIA are in town because they don't want to talk to those strangers. Mm -hmm. there's, there's still a lot of trust building to do. Even um, working through the health services has been really positive, um, but there are still people out there who feel um, they don't understand what the NDIA is and will avoid at all costs because they, they, they feel uncomfortable, they don't know what's going to happen, they're suspicious about how that might impact on them and, and just don't engage. It just it takes a long time. Building trust takes a, a long, long time. And, I mean, one of the good things is when people can see in their own community that someone is benefiting from being on an NDIS plan. Um, and at the moment in a lot of communities, it's still not hugely evident um, that there's a big benefit for people to be um, on the NDIS. And is that message difficult to get through, even if it's conveyed by First Nations people themselves that may be associated with these organisations? Do they have difficulty persuading First Nations people with disability that the NDIS might actually help them? Yeah, I think that um, it's difficult for... I, I, the NDIS is really complicated. I mean, it's hard for people with English as a first you, language. You don't need to persuade me that it's yeah. complicated. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> using, for instance, remote community connectors is, is a really positive thing. We support that idea of someone with language and culture and understanding of that community. But the, the scheme is, is largely, um, yeah, very, very difficult for people to understand. And community connectors, uh, you know, are really it's a positive step, but there needs to be a lot more done than that. Okay. And at a more general level, and to some extent we've talked about this, you have said at paragraph 31 that the NDIS model of developing individualised plans with goals and budgets does not fit neatly with the Nungu tradition and culture. And you've also said at paragraph 160 that the NDIA is highly individualised and is focused on increasing choice and control for individuals with disability, a narrow focus on the individual without an understanding of the importance of family and community conflicts with the Anangu way of living. Is it your view that the NDIS can be adapted to overcome this apparent contradiction between an individualised model and that emphasises choice and control for individuals, 
and a model that emphasises the importance of family and community. Can the NDIS be adapted to make that transition? I think it can if, if there's a willingness and if there's flexibility. Um, and if the NDIA are really committed to making um, the NDIS work in remote areas, it's just about acknowledging that it's very different and that, yeah, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution and that Aboriginal people need to be driving. It needs to be owned by local Anangu people and they need to get the support in the way that they want it um, and it needs to be family-centred to acknowledge the role that families play in, in caring for people with disability in community. Mrs Smith, do you agree with that? Yes. Is there anything you would like to add? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it was said very well in that case. <laughs> Chair, do you mind? Sorry. Oh, no, no, go. Go on, you go. Andrew, you go. Oh, Mr. Mason, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Smith and Ms. McRae, just to, um, just to the Chair's point around flexibility and can it be adapted, what I'm hearing is that Arnable Aboriginal people, First Nations people and Piripa, non-Indigenous people, actually, we might agree on the goal. It's just the destination of how, how we get there. And that should be have the flexibility. It's not that we're going in different directions. Um, and the second point um, I, I'd like to reflect on after hearing what you're saying is if family have always cared for family members with disability, then um, running parallel to anything around like an NDI air system on in remote and very remote areas where families do a lot of informal support, that service of respite is really critical. Um, and do you want to just talk a little bit about that, why it's so critical? Because it seems to me that without respite, um, things could really unravel because people aren't really getting time to have psychosocial well-being. Yep. The honourable with disability as well as family who are supporting. Yeah, um, respite is definitely um, in demand and uh, that's a reflection of there are lots of kind of stresses on families and community I mean, we do respite very differently. We don't just bring someone with a disability in all on their own and, and put them somewhere. Um, respite is about bringing someone with a disability with a, with a family member or maybe with their whole family in with them, coming into town, doing something that they really enjoy, going to the footy, going to whatever's going on at the time. Um, and it actually builds the strength of the whole family. Um, so respite is, is a critical factor to maintain the care in the community, as is the capacity to provide um, practical assistance, swags and blankets and clothing, um, bedding. These are the things that people ask for um, all the time. And these practical things can make the difference um, around maintaining the care arrangement. If you can respond really quickly and provide um, blankets to people because um, there's 16 people in a three-bedroom house and some <coughs> people don't have enough bedding, it's being able to respond to what's going on for that family at that time in a really practical way um, is really important. And I also agree that we, we are not advocating for the NDIS to go away. Um, we just want it to better meet the needs of Anangu. And that just requires will to do that and, and willingness to do that and, and flexibility that's, that's required to, to meet the needs of Anangu people. Perhaps just on that point, and in response to something you said to the chair earlier was about the trust that your community members have in so your organisation and the other local organisations. So can I put it to you, both of you, is, do you think the NDIS should be investing more time and energy into working more closely with those organisations organizations where you have the trust before they commence the individual planning process? Is that something that we should consider? Yes. And what would that look like? 
much. <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, just working with the local organisations, acknowledging that they have that trust story. I mean, it's, it's ignoring a, a resource when you don't work with a local organisation to connect with um, Aboriginal people. Um, we already know people with disability out there. We've been working with them since the mid-1990s. Um, we know the families. Um, we could have provided a lot of support to, um, to help those people access the scheme, but it, it got very complicated. It became a conflict of interest because we were an NDIS provider. We started to be treated like we were, um, yeah, not appropriate to help out with connecting um, people with disability with the scheme because, it, yeah, it was seen as a conflict. But I think that um, it's a wasted resource. So, we, so we, again, more flexibility is yeah, required. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you again. Just one more question. Um, what's the football team of choice for most people on the APY land? <laughs> Port Power and Adelaide Crow. There you go. Port Power and Adelaide Crows, <laughs> according to Margaret. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Commissioner McEwen apparently is a supporter of Port Adelaide, which is an entirely misguided view that he holds. Thank you very much for uh, coming to the Commission. Thank you for the very detailed statement that uh, is very thought-provoking, very helpful, as has been your evidence uh, today and it's given us a lot of things to think about and a great deal of help as to uh, how we might try and address the problems that you've identified. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms McMahon, what do we do now? Mr Griffin will take the next witness. Straight away or? Uh, yes, I understand we won't be having well, a break. He's, that he's leapt up and is, is positively trotting towards <laughs> the bar yeah. table. In that case, we're going to continue, I take it. You'll need to move out of the way so he can yes, trot very up. Much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is Ms. Joanne Horton, spelled H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. Ms. Horton has provided a statement for this public hearing date of the 21st of June, 2022, ID number STAT.0557.0001, the statement is in hearing bundle A at tab 34. And the annexes to her statement are in hearing bundle A at tabs 35 to 38, capital A. Ms. Horton will take an oath. Ms. Horton, uh, thank you also for your statement and for coming to the Royal Commission. You've travelled, I think, from Queensland, have you not, to be here today? Correct. So thank you for making the... Uh, rather long trip to uh, Ellis Springs, and uh, we look forward to hearing your evidence. If you would be good enough, please, to follow the instructions of my associate who is in that direction, she will administer the oath uh, to you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. If you would be good enough uh, to listen to the questions that are about to be asked, then uh, uh, we would be grateful for your responses. Chair, I understand Ms. Jenny Tucker, a solicitor in Cairns, um, is supposed to be online representing this witness. Uh, by telephone? No, just observing the proceedings. Oh, I see. Available. Thank you. Ms. Horton, you're the Managing Director of Creative Consultancy, Proprietary Limited. Creative Consulting, Proprietary mm, Limited. Thank you. Yes. And you provide support coordination services for people in remote communities in far north Queensland under the NDIS. Correct. You're a First Nations woman? 
Yes, I am. And you come from the stolen generation? Yes. When did you first set up the business of providing support coordination services? February 27, 2019. <laughs> so I actually started the business uh, or registered an ABN in December of 2018, so December 26th, and started operating in the support coordination space from 27th of Feb 2019 to now. And what prompted you to set up this business? <laughs> Two things. I was exhausted from the last job I had, um, and that was managing uh, personal helpers and mentors programming Araba. I was worked to the bone and thought I'm going to start my own business. I have um, issues with my own functional capacity and I sometimes can't work from an office-based um, environment. I have to work from bed. And so I thought I, if I start a consulting business and there's going to be times that I can't leave my bed that I could still continue to work and pay my mortgage. Very briefly, what are the chronic health conditions that you suffer from? I don't know if I have to answer that. Oh, um, it's okay. I don't believe in speaking about private medical conditions publicly. That's fine. That's fine. Now, do you employ people in your business? Yes, I do. And how many in total? The last count was 38. And the vast majority of those employees are First Nations people? Correct. All but two. And in addition to providing support coordination services, do you also provide psychosocial recovery coaching? We've just started stepping out into that space, yes. Can you tell me what that means? So, okay, so psychosocial recovery coaching, um, it's a new initiative brought in by the NDIA to um, work alongside support coordinators in a sense to assist the individual to manage and navigate the mental health system and all of their mental health supports. And you also in your business deal with the area of short-term accommodation for respite purposes? Correct. What led you to provide that service? Originally, as a coordinator of supports, we would find uh, other agencies and give individuals choices around which agencies they'd like to go with um, to provide respite slash short-term accommodation. Um, and we did that and it, there were instances where that just did not work, where we saw providers were babysitters, glorified babysitters, um, literally taking the money and not really offering anything substantial to the individual. And then apart from that, separate to that, we would, um, when we did start looking at delivering ourselves, obviously we didn't have a respite house or anything like that at the time. So we would, um, I would book individuals into motels in the Cairns region that were coming down from Cape York and I found a lot of racism. So individuals uh, being treated differently because they are First Nations people. And according to your statement, you currently have 94 current clients? Just under 100, yes. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts are those clients located? Yarraba, Far North Queensland, Cairns. Uh, so the majority are Yarraba, Cairns, Arakoon. And how long does it take you to get from Cairns to Yarraba? Depends on a good day, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's the closest location you go to of the areas you mentioned? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, you mentioned having clients in different locations. Yep. Is Yarraba the closest location you have clients or do you have clients in Cairns itself? Yes, in Cairns as well. Right, thank you. You also indicate in your statement at paragraph 14 that the word disability does not exist in many Aboriginal languages uh, and you refer to the term cultural services provider. Can you explain to the commissioners your thinking behind that? Absolutely. Um, so in this NDIS space, we talk about people with a disability. Um, majority of our clients do not identify as having a disability. And that's one of the issues that we found straight off the bat. So if you don't identify and you're talking to NDIA planners um, and they, you, they're telling you that you have a disability and you're saying, no, I don't, but I do need extra assistance with this, that or the other, 
that's a, there's, that's, it's a major difference. Um, for me personally, yes, I have medical conditions that impact on my functional capacity. I was using assistive technology long before I knew what assistive technology even was. Uh, I still do to this day and found out about those terms when I came into this space. So very recently in the past maybe two to three months, maybe two months, I've solidified my stance in this business that we are not a disability service provider. We are a cultural services provider because people don't come to us for disability support. They come to us because we have Aboriginal people on the front line. In your experience of dealing with the NDIS and the NDIA, is that distinction understood? Sorry, can you repeat the yes. question? In your dealings with people at the NDIA, do they understand that distinction you just drew between having a disability and describing as such or being uh, a cultural services provider? They don't know this yet. They're soon to find out. <laughs> so has this been a change in your thinking as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what prompted you to change your, the way you wanted to express my, myself, first of all, um, I struggled to, the, the very first time I'd identified myself as being a person with a disability was just under two years ago, excuse me, <coughs> I'm 45, 46 next, next month. I've had issues with my spine since I was, I remember the first time I woke up at the beginning of grade nine and I couldn't stand straight, I was bent over like this. And so... That's where it started for me. But it was two years ago when I was defending my position as a provider going into, into Arakoon specifically that I wrote it down on paper and it irked me. It really, really irked me that I had to write, I am also a person with a disability because it's not something that I'd ever identified within myself. I just know that I have issues with my back. I can't clean like regular people can I can't do yard work there's a lot of things I can't do because of my functional capacity so moving into this cultural space came to me recently when I realized you know I've got a lot of clients that still are in that space of no I don't have a disability I just need more assistance and I thought really hard about you know why do people come to my particular service they came to us because we have First Nations people on the ground and they came to us because we have an understanding and we listen. And it was always about being inclusive of culture and family and those connections. Disability comes last. It was about the assistance they needed starting with culture rather than starting with the disability. And we don't, we are also, sorry, we also are not a, um, my consulting business does not just deal in that NDIS space. We also provide services pro bono and paid uh, that we, sorry, work that we get paid for in community and social development work. So that's my degree and that's everything in this business was based around myself and my history. Um, so we do uh, work with other organisations and the funding does not come through the NEIA. Does it follow from what you've just explained that the word disability becomes a label and that the people you deal with are seen through the eyes of their disability rather than who they are. Correct. You mentioned in your statement the question of support coordinators and what their role is. Briefly, on a daily basis, what does a support coordinator do? So many things. A support coordinator has to be across absolutely everything. Um, it's almost expected that you're the knowledge holder of everything. And if you don't know, you need to know very quickly where to find the information. So you need to be across, you know, what is respite, what is intellectual, um, how do you order specific assistive technology items or equipment for individuals. It can range very, very um, different for many individuals. Like it could be making referrals to services and things like that, but there's just so much more entrenched in support coordination than I think people understand. When you decided to work in the area of support coordination, did you have cause to purchase a product called the Support Coordination Toolkit? Yes, I did. Was that produced by the NDIA? No. 
Who was it produced by? <coughs> There's two services that come to mind. I'm not sure which one, so I'm not going to say unless you want me to. That's all right. Yeah. Anyway, as a non-NDIA product, if I can use that term, was that useful when you were setting up your business? No. Why not? There was nothing, I guess, in that toolkit. Uh, no offence to the creators of the toolkit. It's a fantastic toolkit. It's just not relevant to Aboriginal people and it's certainly not relevant to how we work. And it's also aimed at registered providers and not unregistered providers. Did you approach the NDIA to see if they could provide advice or assistance in setting up? No. So is it the case that you worked on trial and error? Correct. What about your staff members? Where does their training come from? Me, directly. And have you devised the training for them? It's been ad hoc, on the fly, as we're running out the door, sitting in a car together, when we're travelling up the Cape in the vehicles, training is happening as much as I can. Unfortunately, I wish I could deliver a lot more, but there's only one of me. I noticed in paragraphs 92 to 93 of your statement you referred to Facebook support groups. Yes. Can you briefly describe what those groups are like and what support they provide, if any? They're fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So one of the first groups I joined, I believe, was the uh, Cost and Plan Managers Unite. Um, absolutely amazing source of information and lived experience from other support coordinators. Are these support coordinators throughout Australia? Yes. And this is a voluntary group? Yes. And do you meet online on a regular basis or is it just a daily checkup? Of the yeah, it's, it, we don't meet or anything like that. It's just that everyone goes in there. Um, you might post a question you have regard, regarding an issue that you're facing and you need assistance or how, does, how did you deal with this? How does someone else deal with this particular thing? And you get feedback. And so others are very willing, um, amazing people in that group share their information and their resources freely. And do I take it that the people sharing information and resources are not being paid to do that? That's no. a mutual support group. Correct. Have any members of that group, to your knowledge, approached the NDIA to see if something more formal could be provided by way of training and information? I have no idea. I couldn't answer that. Sorry. Sitting here today, do you think it would be worthwhile making that approach, given the experience you had in setting up? Repeat the question, but maybe a diff bit differently. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't understanding that, sorry. I was wondering whether anyone had contemplated approaching the NDIA and saying, in effect, can you provide training and resources to enable people to set up the sort of business you've set up? I don't know if anyone else in that group has. I don't know people personally in that group. Um, it started out with about, when I joined originally, I think it was around seven hundred of us and then and now there's thousands and thousands of people in there mm. um i don't even have that much in my social circle so <laughs> i wouldn't know everyone or what their intentions are but i just love the group itself it's been a fantastic source of um i guess comfort for me when i know that i'm at a loss of what to do i go there and seek help like so that, the NDIA, sorry, is, is the last resort. Why is it the last resort? Mainly because my own personal experience, when I've spoken to individuals in the NDIA, the time, they don't give you the time to sit and listen. Um, I want to preface this also just to say that I work with some amazing people in the NDIA. Uh, especially the remote planners up in Weeper. Um, and there's a remote team and Wendy Tucker, who leads a lot of those teams, she's amazing herself. So this is not against individuals in this space. This is very much about the NDIA as a system. Um, they do not give us the time. And even if we asked for the time, you know, an hour or two is not going to cut it. Is the most important single characteristic of a good support coordinator the ability to listen to the needs of the 
the client? Absolutely, yes. And you've come across many good support coordinators. Yes. But you've come across ones that, to use my expression, didn't cut the mustard. Baseline work. So they'd be happy to do, I guess, a level one support coordination, telling people about the services and not doing much else. Um, level two, we are required to link them in and make those warm referrals. And I take it by inference from your answer that when one's dealing with First Nations people in remote and very remote communities, there is a high level of special skill required to be a good support coordinator. Correct. And you've hit the nail on the head there. There should be a lot more funding of specialist support coordination, which there isn't. And would that extra funding you advocate for also include, include training? Yes, absolutely. Um, sorry, hang on one sec. I just want to make sure that I've heard your question mm -hmm. correctly. If you could repeat that. You would advocate for more funding to assist people becoming support coordinators in those communities. Is that correct? You can't get funding for training. I appreciate that. that. I'm asking you whether you would like the system to... Oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. And separate from the, the hourly rate. Yes. And so rather than just being paid for the provision of coordination services, there would be an allocation for training and what in modern parlance might be called upskilling to be able to do the job well. Absolutely. Yes. And do I further assume that such people should be at a high level of ability to identify culturally safe approaches to doing that job? Yes. Excuse me one sec. <coughs> Might need a tissue. It's okay. Take your time. Just some, want some water? That's someone else's water. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay, I'm good. Can I talk to you about the question of being registered with yes. the NDIA? Creative Consulting has decided to remain an unregistered provider. What are your reasons for that? A lot of reasons. So when I first started, uh, sorry, um, I'll give you the reasons and I'll tell the story. So the main reason is this scheme was brought in to create change. It was brought in to give people choices. It was brought in to give them control over their supports, their services. So I speak this out often that if we're going to be funneling people down the same pathway to registered providers that they had been prior to the NDIS rollout in Australia, what difference does that make to the previous models of disability supports and services? It makes no difference at all. So in order to have choice and control, you need to have a variety of providers, whether registered or unregistered. You, as I understand it, initially explored registration. Correct. What made you decide not to pursue that? I am still a registered provider as a sole trader, mm -hmm. but I've never made a service booking online right. to claim money directly. I've always gone through plan managers. When I went into a company model, by the time I'd gone into a company model, sorry, I'd done enough research, learnt enough about the, the system, really looked at the options, but also looked at, you know, my own people. If it's hard for me as someone who's had access to resources, education and other opportunities to learn this scheme and to go in and to start up as a provider, and it's been difficult, then to find the additional potential $7,000, which was the cost of an audit at the time that I had started my business as a sole trader, without a single client and without any income, how was I going to afford $7,000 worth of auditing costs? It was completely unreasonable. And so 
I then ended up somehow finding a registered provider that I could sit under their registration so that I could still deliver to people that were coming to me with agency managed support coordination in their plans. One of the other barriers to registration that you refer to appears at paragraph 61 and 62 of your statement. If I can summarise, you say the requirement that staff have a blue card to work with children and a yellow card or a disability worker screening clearance is difficult in circumstances where First Nations potential staff members may have a criminal record. Correct. Now, without going into that in detail, we know that First Nations people generically are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. To obtain the necessary cards, uh, is one disqualified simply because you have a criminal conviction or does it depend on what the nature of that conviction was? It's the nature of the conviction, uh, your intentions behind what it was that you were convicted of and the outcomes and whether or not that resulted in any significant harm towards a person with a disability. And what's the administrative time taken for you to make those inquiries and secure those cards? for a potential employee? Um, at the moment, I don't know because I don't do that anymore in my business, thank oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, someone else does that. <laughs> so, But when I was doing it, uh, that's it, hours and hours of work, depending. It really depends on the individual, what their criminal history looked like. Um, I myself had a criminal history from when I was 17, 18, 19, and I didn't know that there was a 10-year uh, what's the, the, where it stops? Yes. And so for 20 years, I was telling the government, limitations. statute of limitations, thank you. I didn't know about the statute of limitations. So every time I applied for a job, uh, federal government, state government, I would always tell them, I'm a criminal from, you know, when I was a teenager, and I would have to write a statement. I didn't realise that wasn't a thing after 10 years that the statute of limitations had expired, and I didn't need to do that anymore. Um but in that, I still had to explain why I was charged, what I was charged for, and what I've done, I guess, to better myself um, or improve my circumstances that enables me to get a job in government. In paragraph 62, you elaborate upon what you've just said, and you finish by saying, many people do have criminal records, often for minor offences resulting from punitive policies, such as alcohol management plans. Correct. Can you give the commissioners an example of a person in that situation? Sure. Um, I'm just thinking my mother calls it an Aboriginal management plan, and I agree. So we uh, don't call them alcohol management plans because they are targeted at Aboriginal communities. When, when the alcohol management plans came out, uh, sorry, um, when all of this came out, and especially in places like home at Yarraba, you know, you'd have the police sitting up on the hill waiting for a car to come over to pounce on the car, take your vehicle away if you've got more than or even a cup more than what you're supposed to take in, and automatically you're sent straight through to the justice system. So when the alcohol management plans came out and even the uh, uh, income management in the Cape, because I was the face of income management when it first came out, myself and another went up and delivered that. So we were front and front line as far as understanding where people were caught up in the justice system because of um, anything in, I guess, child safety and other areas. But the Family Responsibilities Commission ultimately um, would make decisions around, you know, what's going to happen with that person after the fact. I'm sorry, my memory's not that great at the moment, but what we found was that you might be charged with a criminal offence under child safety or under, you know, something to do with alcohol or some other issue, and then they just keep adding up. So instead of having maybe one issue that you should have been charged for, you have a multitude of issues. So it looks like you're a major criminal when really all you're trying to do is live your life. Yes. Can I ask um, that map five, which is the map of far north Queensland, be brought up? Can you 
Can you see that map, Ms. Horton? Yes, I can. Now, you're based in Cairns, which is, I think, clear for everyone to see. You can see the road going up to Weeper, which used to be called the Development Road, but I think now has a different title. Peninsula Development Road. Yes. And in my time in that part of the world, it was unsealed completely, and I still to this day remember every corrugation I drove over. What's the current situation of driving from Cairns to Weeper? Uh, they've done some really good work on that road in the past six months to a year. Um, I believe there's only 250 kilometres left of unsealed road. Did you say only 200 <laughs> kilometres? Only 250 <laughs> kilometres, ah. yes. <laughs> thought you might have meant 250 metres. But... No. <laughs> there are no short sealed sections outside a local councillor's house. <sighs> I'm not sure. How long would it take you to drive from Cairns to Weeper, assuming good weather conditions? 12 hours. And so on how many occasions would you or representatives of your business ideally travel to see clients in Weeper? We don't have clients in Weeper. We have clients in Arakoon. Sorry, in Arakoon, I should say. And recently, Mapu. Hmm. And so that's another Two hours between Weeper and Arakoon, so is it still a 12-hour trip? Or? It is. So we go to Weeper to see the planners. Yes. And then you go down to Arakoon. And then we drive down to Arakoon, correct. And you're often there for between two days, three days? Yes. And then you've got to repeat the drive back? Correct. For how much of the year can you do that trip by road? Compared? As often as the weather will allow. Mm -hmm. Uh, majority of the time it's based on weather, wet weather season. So we had a really big wet season over this last six months leading up to our first trip this year was in May. So uh, that was only two months ago, less than two months ago. So is it your ambition, given good weather conditions, that you might travel there six times in a year? More would be great. Mm -hmm. um, I have found an amazing, amazing person um, who I've employed in Arakoon now. She's a local lady, traditional owner, very smart woman. Um, I'm really happy that she's on board because hopefully that'll reduce our need to travel to Arakoon and we can then focus on another community. Why is it important for support coordinators to travel to a community such as Arakoon? Language, uh, understanding, People speak mul multiple languages. English isn't everyone's first language. Um, body language is a big part of Aboriginal people. We can have a whole conversation without speaking at all, um, using facial expressions, body movements, um, ways that we might move our body or our head. Or So it's cap capturing some of those um, that you, you're never going to see or hear via a Zoom conversation or um, phone consult. What do you miss if you have to use a Zoom facility as opposed to being there in person? I think I've only ever had one Zoom conference and that was the very first one that led to us becoming a provider in Arica. Right. And that was really difficult. Um, it actually wasn't even Zoom. We were scheduled for Zoom, but I was running between clients, pulled up at a shopping centre car park, got on the phone and did a phone cons consult in the car park with these potential new clients that wanted to come on. And I take it that by being on the ground, you also have the ability to build rapport with the people you're dealing with. Absolutely, yes. Because and that's so important. Because you're not simply coming in and leaving a few hours later. Yeah, and I need for people to know that we're here for them. We're not here for the government. We're not here for the scheme. We're here to deliver according to their needs, their wants, their desires, their hopes, their dreams. And so the only way to capture all of that information is by building relationships with those individuals on the ground. How does your business try and make it cost effective to travel such large distances? I don't. I've suffered financially as a result of travelling north, but I wouldn't change that. 
as in I wouldn't change the service delivery side. If I could capture the money back, that would be amazing um, because I didn't have a vehicle that I could travel with. Um, I was getting around in an old 1990, oh no, 2002 Nissan X Trail. And luckily, I have a staff member, um, a lady who came with me on my very first trip, and she had a Toyota Prado. And so then I paid her from the very get go, every staff member whose vehicle I've used. I've always paid 87 cents per kilometre for a 2,200 2, kilometre round trip, which equates to around $1,760 after we return, not including accommodation, wages, overheads, all of that. Just splitting out the transport costs as a discrete item, does that $1,700 odd actually meet the costs of fuel maintenance registration of the vehicle? Not when you're travelling over hundreds of kilometres of corrugated road. And is that because, firstly, it's compulsory in those parts of the world to have a four-wheel drive? Absolutely. Yes. And so has your experience been in your business that the reimbursement you receive for travel doesn't cover the actual cost to you of the travel? Um, can I be completely honest and say that I didn't know and the NDIA did not bother to even make me aware that I could claim the, tra the travel component of going up to remote communities until one of them turned up at my office because they needed my assistance with something and was using that as, I guess, bait to get me to sit and work with them. And so my first time ever claiming travel was in May. And that's also the same for my partners in this business, Active Performance, the therapist that we travel with. May was the first time that they also had claimed uh, travel for the first time. And yet we've been delivering up there for two years. The NDIA would know from their own records of invoices that you had been there. Correct. Did you ask them why they hadn't told you that you were entitled to compensation for travel costs? No, until that lady came to my office. But it was, like I said, she had a, an underlying reason for being there, and that was for me to support her to do her job. Under the NDIS, can one make a claim for what I will call back pay? There's a, so you can send your invoices off to provide a payment. I'm not too sure if I sent invoices now for travel from plans two to three years ago that I could actually get that money back. Um, I know that now if a plan ends, you have three months to claim from the old plan. So effectively the three-month limit is a cutoff. Correct. And you lose any entitlement after that. And it's ridiculous, yes. Why is it ridiculous? Because there's people like me who just don't know. And had we known or had we been shown how to make those claims, that would have made life a lot easier. I'm still learning a lot in this space. Like I said, it's a very big, very complex system. And so for me, the travel component was the least of my concerns when I've got people on the ground that are suffering without supports. Ms Horton, the Royal Commission received an email from a solicitor on behalf of the Arakoon Shire Council who had the opportunity to read your statement. And in that email, they acknowledge the work you've been doing and they don't make any criticism whatsoever. But they do point out that the Shire Council has a group called Shivery, which is C-H-I-V-A-R-E-E Centre, which... I understand prior to the NDIS and post-NDIS has been providing some services in the disability area. Correct. Are you aware of the work they do? Yes. And they go on in this letter to indicate that they have what I will call nine clients and that two of those you provide support coordination services for. Possibly, yes. It could be right. Uh, commissioners, what we'll do in due course is we'll tender this email because it's been sent by way of a submission. Thank you. Now, I'm told that I have to wrap up within 10 minutes, Ms. Horton, so I will do my best to move quickly.
you comment in your statement from paragraphs 33 onwards about the lack of service providers. And I think you outlined that in some detail. But then importantly, you referred to respite and the limited options available. Have you set up some short-term accommodation to provide respite care? Yes, I have. What prompted you to do that? The lack of culturally appropriate or responsive services that would look after our mob properly. And that was really important because of your clients in Arakoon? Yes. And it's also important because people have to travel from Arakoon to Cairns or elsewhere to receive certain services from time to time, don't they? Yeah, and it's good for them to get out of community, to come to Cairns, to uh, participate in, if, if it's a physical disability, say, to come and trial equipment, to look through the mobility stores, things that they don't have access to in those communities, no. And when they make those trips, do you arrange accommodation for them? Always. And was that because previously there wasn't, in your view, appropriate accommodation available? It wasn't so much the accommodation, but people. Yes. Humans are horrible. Can be. You also comment. <laughs> In the sense that racism, it's, that's what it comes down to. Yep. We had a lot of issues with clients getting kicked out of motels because other family members were standing outside wanting to come in and the Aboriginal culture of sharing was not accepted. So someone who wants to bring a family member in with them had a, an, it, one particular incident. Uh, the client was inside, asleep, in his room, in the motel, but a family member was outside talking to the security guard. And then that resulted in some kind of scuffle. The client, who had no idea what was going on, um, woke up and was kicked out of the motel because the family member was outside wanting to come in and share the room because they knew that there were two beds and there's only one person in that particular room. The support worker was in another room. So Aboriginal culture of sharing, you want to give your family member a bed to sleep on. Uh, unfortunately, that particular client had no idea, but it resulted in him getting kicked out of there and being told not to come back. And so that was the clincher for me to start respite. And do you hope to expand that service? Um, I've just rented another house in East Trinity uh, last week, two weeks ago, and I'm setting that up because the first respite house has been overtaken by men. And so we're setting up a new house now that's, uh, it's a three, three floors. So I've got elders on the top, respite in the middle for women and psychosocial recovery coaches. And on the floor, it'll be children's therapies because there's nothing for children in Yarraba. Um, but this is, that particular building is for people from Yarraba and Gengara. But the respite will be for anyone that wants to come in or needs respite, so any females in their family. On the question of the complexity of the NDIS plans, can I summarise what I understand your evidence to be? That the NDIS plans are too difficult for your clients to understand without a lot of support? Correct. And as a consequence, somebody from your business will sit in on most planning meetings with the clients? Yes. Firstly, to let the clients know what the plan involves and how it works but also to educate the planners. Tell the commissioners about what you mean by educating the planners. Um, how many issues have we educated on? Is there something specific, well, specific you want me to speak about? In relation to Aboriginal culture <clears throat> and the very limited understanding that some planners have of country, culture and community. Oh, absolutely. Um, understanding the geographical distance between places or lack of services and how long it would take them to actually get out of community or drive to the nearest uh, service provider if there was one. Um, we've had to educate planners on the need for what, what I call four-wheel drive wheelchairs because the landscape is completely different to regional and urban centres. So we have to make sure that people who are needing um, equipment on the ground, that the equipment is suited to the environment that they live in. Uh, that's a big thing. And so we always put that out there first. We don't wait for the planners to come back and say, we've issued you funding for this wheelchair or whatnot. Um, we make sure that we are requesting in the planning meeting a four-wheel drive wheelchair to make sure that the person can get around safely. 
And then you have a section in your statement from paragraphs 98 through to 102 dealing with the question of exploitation. You also, I believe, have a concern, firstly, that your clients are vulnerable to exploitation. Correct. And secondly, a general concern about whether the services said to be provided to them are always provided. Correct. If you have a suspicion that services have not been provided but have been charged for, do you raise that with the authorities? Yes. Have you had, have you had cause to do that? Yes. And have you had a positive response to raising no. that issue? No. Why not? What happened? I discovered fraud or fraudulent claims against 18 of my clients in November of last year. Spent about eight hours investigating all of the invoices and what appeared to be multiple uh, carbon copy invoices for time apparently spent with clients. I had two of those that were affected by that were flying in that morning for respite. So I met with them. That was the first meeting I had of the day. The minute they got off the plane from Aracoon, because I had three gentlemen come down, um, I took two of the gentlemen aside and sent the other one off with a support worker. And then I had an ad hoc meeting with these two gentlemen, a couple of my staff and Queensland Health, three Queensland Health reps in Aracoon to explain what I'd uncovered. Um, they explained it. They went and saw clients in community talked to them about it, found out that these services weren't delivered. Very long story short, within that two-day period, I had contacted the NDIA, spoken to them. Um, nothing came of that. And I also contacted the commission and they told me to put it in an email. And I knew that putting any that in an email was not going to go anywhere because there is uh, unbelievable amounts of people waiting for outcomes of these, of their own issues that they've taken to the uh, commission and they haven't been actioned and this is two years later. So is it the case that in relation to what you've just been mentioning, you've lost confidence in that system? Of... Yes, I have. Finally, can I just deal very briefly with the question of travel by air? During the wet season, is it economically viable to travel by air to Arakan? For who, sorry? For you, firstly, and then? No. And is that because the cost isn't properly compensated for? Correct. Is it also the case that Queensland Health have provided some financial assistance on occasions? They don't give me money in my pocket, no. What's happened is they have a patient travel scheme. So they've included, uh, when I've contacted or asked for assistance with um, a client, can we get them a, some kind of specialist appointment in Cairns so that they can come down and get their OT assessment done, which is NDIS related. Um, I've had significant help in that. And because we had had this happen so often, but then we have a lot of clients with psychosocial disability up there and they saw the benefits of um, those individuals coming and staying with us. And when they got home, their whole demeanour was so different. Um, I just quickly wanted to say the last lady that gave evidence around respite and taking people out of community and bringing them into places where they have access to different opportunities. We do exactly the same thing. We love this because we get to see people grow right in front of us. And then they get to go home with this new fresh perspective. Um, so for the Queensland Health, sorry, they saw this. They saw those, those uh, individuals coming back in and how beneficial this was for their mental health. And so they um, asked me to start putting together a, a letter at first as to why we were requesting flights um, through the patient travel scheme. So we did that for a few individuals. And then after a while, we got word that they had made it into policy for themselves or they'd changed something within their own system to allow for respite to become a valid reason for patient travel to fly clients with an escort to Cairns. My final question in relation to transport is, is it your understanding the NDIS will not fund a carer to go with a client? They don't. And is it also your understanding that the local airline in the area we're talking about requires a carer to accompany such a person? They do. Kristen, I don't want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions given the time. Thank you very much. I'll ask first Commissioner Mason whether she has any questions for you. Thank you very much. 
for your evidence this afternoon um, and for the work that you're doing. And thank you for sharing that um, experience around respite um, because it's uh, so important in remote communities, um, a service for the, it's actually for the whole community when people are looking after their own emotional, social, psychosocial needs. Um, with, with good support, so thank you for, for that. Um, I just was interested, this Facebook page, um, which has been a great source of information and also problem solving, um, since you've been working um, and providing support, have you, has there been an opportunity for uh, businesses like the ones, that one that you run, to come together with other First Nations businesses together to talk about and share and exchange knowledge, a bit like that Facebook page. Since you've started in the business, has there been any type I of do that myself, as in I have assisted personally to date now 26 individuals and organisations with starting their own business in this sector. But we have... Um, we have come together and have little meetings here and there, usually before travelling together or things like that. Um, but honestly, you don't really have time because there's no, like even me being here today, there's no money for me. I'm losing money sitting here, but I'm here for a reason. Um, same with any meetings that happen regarding anything that's to do with the sector and not directly related to a client. We can't claim any of that. Um, so it's not viable for services to often come together and share information and knowledge. I will say one thing, though, is that the state government, Queensland state government, um, I will be seeking to have a meeting with them at some stage soon because they came and consulted me and I poured out all of my intellectual um, experiences, sorry, my intellectual property and my experiences to them and they've now created a program which is exactly everything I've done and given me absolutely no acknowledgement of my blood, my sweat, my tears for the last few years in this space. Um, and they're taking up what I've been doing and making it their own, which is really disgusting, and I'm going to speak that out. Um, so, no, there haven't been any opportunities. I was explaining to... Uh, my DRC councillor outside just earlier on around, um, sorry, my brain's just stopped. Can you please? It's okay. So what I understand is any, any way of having a community of practice, if I can use that term, of exchanging and learning and uh, and helping you to work oh. smarter and not harder, you, that's that's your effort as opposed okay. to um, a system that helps everyone to be upskilled and improved uh, across the board. It's it's, it has to be, it's it's done by individual people. So the the remote or the very remote team, I'm not sure what they call themselves, but they have had meetings um, with support coordinators where we all have sat down in a Zoom session or whatnot. I just found the meetings weren't valuable. Um, it was, like I said, one hour or two hours, and you really need time to nut out a lot of things. You can't cover, you know, 10 topics properly when you're only given a very short time frame. Um, the other issue that I had with attending, the, the reason I no longer attend those meetings is because at the very last meeting I attended, I'd asked a question about medical consent for clients because I found that a lot of our clients had plans that were carbon copies of each other. And so we try to help them to gather the evidence to get uh, prepared to make, you know, and, and uh, for to prepare, sorry, for a plan review. And so when I asked about medical consent and things like that, the person who was facilitating the session said, oh, that's not our job. And so I immediately shut down because I just thought, well, you have no idea what it is that we deal with on the ground and yet you're one of the leaders in this space. And so I never went back. And so was that meeting for um, the department to improve their practice or was it what, what was the motivation? coordinators to improve their practice in the okay. Cape? 
but there was also some limitations in what they would do in terms of improvement based on what you just said? It's very much a model for rural Australia, not very remote. So they're great people, don't get me wrong. But one of the things I'm really strong on is you weren't there when I started this business. You didn't help me start this business. You weren't there giving me information and advice and support. You did not help me to build my business model. So don't think you can come in three years after the fact and say, well, this is how you should be running it. Does that make sense? I'm a private business. I'm a private company. I'm not an organisation. I'm not government funded. I've never had government funding. I've never had a grant. I've never had a loan. I've built this up from day one by myself. And now I have an amazing team of people. For the NDIA to bring out this new support coordination manual that they bought out about three, four months ago and say, this is how you're supposed to do business. Well, no, I'm sorry. We've been doing this a lot longer than what you have, if you've done it at all. Uh, because the manual itself does not recognise anything in that Aboriginal space. And even the NDIA, um, I was explaining to the councillor, they, as a commission, you guys have some kind of funding to allow you to do engagement properly. The NDIA has funding for them, themselves and their staff to do engagement properly. They don't give that same that thing to us. They don't afford us the same thing. And so when we claim our time, if we claim outside of that, if I was to put an invoice to say three hours spent engaging with client to build a relationship, I would be shot down in a second because I need to be sending an email or making a referral or one of those things. But you can't do that without the initial engagement. Thank you very much. Commissioner McEwen. No question. Thank you for your evidence. Um, in asking this question, um, I don't want to have any figures from you, but what are the major sources of revenue for your company? Where do you get, where do you get your funds from? For the last three years, support coordination. Uh, the last 12 months, respite. And the last, well, 12 months as well, support work, but that's only because of the respite. So we had to get... I had to employ people to look after the people in respite. And where does the uh, money for the respite care come from? Who pays you for that? The NDIA. The NDIA pay you directly? Through a plan manager. Through a plan manager. And the same for support coordination, I Correct. Think. Yeah, I follow it. Thank you. Um, you explained why you um, use the designation cultural services provider rather than a disability services provider. Um, does that create any um, problems of understanding in the sense that you present your company as a cultural services provider, but in fact, what then has to happen is for the people you are assisting, they need to be regarded by the system as people Correct. with disability and they need to get a plan approved in their capacity as a person with disability. Does that create any sort of conflicts? So I don't mean um, between you and your clients, but any conflicts in perception as to what it is you actually do? It shouldn't do because this scheme, again, is supposed to allow unregistered providers and allow uh, individuals to access mainstream services. There's so things that have absolutely nothing to do with disability. How do you promote inclusion when everything is disability? So the answer is no, it doesn't present a problem. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you very much for your um, evidence, for the uh, statement and for explaining things to us today. Been very helpful and very interesting. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. Uh, Chair, the hardworking people in the background of this Royal Commission need a break. And we also need a short break to set up the next witness, the Namak family. So can I suggest um, 10 minutes? Hmm. Who's the next witness? The Namok family. Oh, right. That's been organised. I see. Yes. yes. That was from earlier today. Very good. All right. Well, we'll adjourn for 10 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Thank you.
the Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Rock. Um, commissioners, we will next hear from the Namok family who will appear via AVL from Gimoy, Cairns. Commissioners will see on the screen Mrs. Bakoy Namok, Bernard Namok, Kanisha Namok, and Simeon Namok. From time to time, Bernard may assist in communication. And the Namok family is also supported by Tyrone Day of the Royal Commission and Ms. Carly Wallace of FPDN. Uh, Bakoy Namok has provided a statement for this public hearing dated the 9th of July, 2022. And this statement can be found at hearing bundle A, tab 33. The family um, will all be taking an oath. Yes. Thank you very much uh, to uh, the entire family for coming to the Royal Commission remotely. We're very grateful to you for being willing to give evidence and for having provided uh, a, a statement uh, through Bakoy. Uh, if, if you would be good enough, we will uh, administer the oath through my associate, whom I hope you will be able to see on the screen. No, my associate will explain what needs to be done. And if you would be kind enough to follow her instructions, that will be the administration of the oath. So thank you very much again. I will read you all the oath. At the end, please all say yes or I do. Do you all swear? by Almighty God, that the evidence which you shall all give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. yes. yes thank you very much. I will now ask Ms. Tarago, who is uh, in the Ellis Springs hearing room, to ask you some questions. <clears throat> and I'm sure it's been explained, but just to be absolutely sure. I should indicate that in the Alice Springs hearing room, I have on my left Commissioner Mason and on my right Commissioner McEwen. And uh, I am the chair of the Royal Commission and it is the three commissioners who are sitting on this particular hearing. Ms. Taraga. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is also customary throughout the Torres Strait uh, to acknowledge the coming of the light and in particular the celebrations of the 1st of July that are held each year throughout the Torres Strait. It is a recognition of um, the acceptance and um, representation of Christianity throughout the region and Mama Namok um, will lead her evidence in a short prayer. Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again to be here, Lord. Lord, I pray that you have your way, Lord, for listen, Lord, to our needs of our people, Lord, of this land. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Rock. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mama Namok, you provided a statement to the Royal Commission. It was a document that you signed. And the document, are the contents true and correct? Yes. Um, today you will all be giving evidence. Um, so Mama Namok, you with your children today, and you'll be ex speaking of the experiences of Simeon Boise who's seated next to you and sharing in that journey. And he's asked you and the family to do that for him. Yes. And as a family, um, it is customary throughout the islands that family can speak on behalf of family. Yes, that's correct. Um, but I'd, I'd first like to ask Boise, Thank you for coming today. You're a very quiet person. 
and you're also a father. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you tell the commissioners the things that you like to do? So one of the things you like to do? Mm. Like in your spare time, one of the things you, you like to do? Do you like fishing? Yeah, fishing. You like, sorry. Yeah, fishing. Uh, Simeon was saying he likes to fish. And um, yeah. yeah. And you like spending time with family? Yeah. And you like being back home in the islands? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mama Namok, how many children do you have? And um, you have three of your children here on screen with you. Your other daughter is back home. Yes, due to a commitment, she's back home. Yeah. Um, and today we had to reshuffle a little bit the timetable. And was that because even though there were very good plans to book transport, the taxi decided not to come? Yes. And is that something that happens quite often in Cairns? Yes. Is there only one taxi that can transport Wheezy to certain places or are there many different taxis that can do that? Only um, wheelchair taxi service for the needs of here. So how many of them? I'm not too sure. Okay. But it, it has been a problem in the past that even in Cairns, a city, that it's very difficult to get transport for wheelchair yes. access. Yes. But we're here today, all together, so mm. we'll continue. Um, Mama Namok, can you tell me a little bit about your family and your late husband? I have a, my name. Oh, I think it's your name. And... My name is um, Bakoi Pao Ni Pao Namok. We're married to um, Bernard, and we together we have four children. Bernard Jr., Betty, Kanisha, Simeon, and um, Sandra, yeah. And uh, your husband is very well known throughout the Torres Strait and Australia? Uh, yes, um, designer of the Torres Strait flag. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to ask for the operator to play a video which talks about your husband. Um, and Bernard is also in the video, and it's called Carry the Flag. Operator, I ask that you display doc ID TTP.9999.002.0001. It's hard living on the mainland. You leave your family, you leave your culture, and you leave your lifestyle back on the island. A lot of people don't know that I'm a Torres Strait Islander, or even where the Torres Strait is.
Australia government recognized the flag in 1995, but it was first flown for Castle Festival 1992. My dad, Bernard Namok Sr., designed the Torres Strait flag. The, the flag was important because it represented us, Torres Strait Islanders. The Aboriginal people had their, the flag that represented them. It identified us as a race of people from Australia. We were different to the Aboriginal people. I'd like to call upon Bernard Jr. to come forward now. Webo is going to raise the flag here at this monument. Makes me feel proud to be asked to raise the flag at any events. It's a responsibility that was passed on. I feel like it's my job to continue on where Dad left off. So commissioners would have had the benefit of seeing you all in that video and we saw, so, saw Boise and Bernard raising the flag. Um, thank you, operator, that carried the flag video was produced by Tamron Tree Pictures. Now, Bernard, are you able to share with the commissioners the importance of your father's journey and the responsibility for you and your people? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I wanted to continue on the legacy of my late dad and also to um, to carry on, um, I guess, you know, where dad left off, designed the flag in 1992, passed away in 93. I was seven years old? Nine. I was nine years old when, when dad passed on. So I wanted to do a, a nice little, um, um, I guess, uh, a documentary for the 25th anniversary of the flag five years ago. And um, yeah, just to continue on and um, I guess the importance of that flag and what that flag means and um, who it represents. And this year you celebrate the 30th anniversary. Yeah, the 30th anniversary um, of that flag, which was uh, May 29th, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, um, Mama Namok, um, how old was Boise when you lost your late husband? Five months. Yeah. Kanisha was two. Betty was eight. Bernard, nine. Can you tell the commissioners about um, Boise growing up and his health journey? He was really um, quiet boy. And was he sick from time to time? Yeah, he was <coughs> here yeah, 12, 12 months. Yeah, he had... Um, um, well, we didn't know back the time when he was sick, you just um, had a rheumatic um, high temperature all the time from baby onwards, growing up, yeah, from, yeah, high and temperature and they would take to hospital, they just say, diagnosed, give him Panadol and went go back home. So he's been growing right through his uh, ch childhood. Yeah. When we usually go to our church um, rallies, when he got sick, then we visited hospital. When we over at um, New Mapun, Bamiga, we went there. And last one, we went to Wipa church rally. He got sick there. Then um, I remember taking him to um, that community center in Napranam. 
and the doctor, Dr. Wong, diagnosed him with, um, um, he had a touch of rheumatic fever. And back then I didn't know anything about rheumatic fever. How, yeah. he, he told me when go back to Thursday Island, um, take him to the hospital and, and told the, tell the doctor that um, he has a touch of rheumatic fever. Yeah, and that's it. And he was one of the first people in the Torres Strait to have been diagnosed with rheumatic heart disease. Yes. And when he was about nine or 10, he had um, surgery to have a mechanical valve put in. Yes, that's, yes, that's correct. We went to um, Brisbane now when he was nine. Yeah, he had that, that yeah, Prince Charles Hospital. That, that's where we went, um, he had that valve um, replacement. Yeah, mm. had to put that mechanical um, valve. Yeah back in um, 2002. And, and since then, he's had to take some medication from time to time. And, and last year in September, um, he had missed a little bit of medication and became sick. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I just want to talk about that time. Um, Boise had been... Uh, going between your house and also uh, Hammond Island where his partner lives and the baby? Yes. And um, can you tell me a, a little bit about what happened in oh. September? Yeah, when he was um, with his partner, weekend trip, I, yeah, at the same time they had that sorry business that yeah, partner, grandma, yeah. Then um, his um, dad came over to me that morning, Wednesday. He asked me about Simeon um, medication. And I told him that um, I, I tried to ring Simeon uh, to find out. You know, I always check up on him. How he's going? Is he on tablets? And remember to take his tablets and yeah, all that. Then um, his dad came. Yeah, talk to his dad. And I was really angry with uh, my yeah, um, because Boise that type of person that he won't tell you um, if he's sick. He just do things for family. Out of yeah, yeah. So when you're talking about the dad, that's. Was his partner's father? Yes. Yes. Um, and so, Boise, you became sick, and uh, your partner's father took you by dinghy to TI to Thursday Island. Yeah. Um, and a dinghy is the normal way that that people travel between the islands day to day. Yeah. Um, so, Mama Namok, you and Kanisha ended up um, travelling to Townsville where the hospital had transported Boise because he was unwell? Yes. I got a phone call from Kanisha because I was at home. Uh, she rang me and um, told me that um, they, they were going to go send Boise down to Townsville, um, because yeah, he was really sick. I said, okay. So I, um, the second call, when Kanisha <clears throat> rang, that's why I got panic and I catch a cab from my place to down to the hospital. I went in, they said that uh, they, they had to uh, emergency, send Boise down to Townsville and a Freud flying doctor on the 3rd of September. Yeah. And so um, in, in various times, you all, uh, you and Kanisha traveled down to, to be with Boise in Townsville and he received treatment there. Yes. And then sometime after that, did he go to Cairns for rehabilitation? 
Yes, Kanisha came down October to be with me because I couldn't take it. Yeah. He came down to get the support. Then we stayed in Townsville for till November. Then we flew back to Cairns. Um, yeah. From Townsville University Hospital to Cairns Base Hospital, 4th of November. And how important is it for your family to support one another and be with one another during those times? Is, is it important? Yes. It's really like be with, at this time, we need to be connected with one another, with families, yeah. And so you have to travel a long way um, and sometimes very costly. But because of that connection, it's very important to be together. Yes. And people back home in the islands also supported to make sure that you were okay, both of you, to support Boise? Uh, my, my immediate family, yes, They're very supportive in financial, yeah, yeah. And so while in Cairns, um, do you remember hearing about the NDIS? So you be you be talking about an NDIS when you be young kids? No, not really. Because yeah. it was like new to us. Yeah. So had you heard about the NDIS before? We heard about NDIS because we got that services up in TI, but not like people come out and. Okay. Like, um, have you heard about that services before? No, mm. not really. And so when you were at the hospital, did you meet with some people on a teleconference from the NDIS? Do you remember that? Yeah. Can you tell the commissioners about that? Speak now. Um, like, not, like you meet up with NDIS um, on teleconference on weekends before, like when boys would come back from town. So. Well, only the one, the one time there, I don't know, we, we, we meet up, we had that um, TV teleconference, teleconference yeah, mm. with boys mm. were there. I think it was November. November last year, yeah. we um, that was the first time we've um, got introduced um, and heard of NDIS, but didn't have um, a proper understanding to how it all works. And yeah, did you have any interpreters? No, no. And did you get any papers that might have been in Creole? No. Did you um, feel like in that meeting that you needed more time to understand things? Yes. yes. And in that meeting, did Boise, was he asked questions? Yes, yes. he was present at that time. Well, did he ask, well, have you asked them questions too? They've asked um they've asked him um questions um what he wants um what he want uh, where he where he wants to um stay living arrangements if he wants to um be in a facilities with others or um living at home with families and he responded and gave them an answer and what was that answer? Um, he told them that he wants to live with family. And was that back home, Boise? Back on the islands? 
Is that where you wanted to go to be with family back in the yeah. island? Yeah. Is it important to you to live back home in the islands? Yeah. And what about now, Mama Namoko or Kanisha? Do you understand what the NDIS is about? Plus, I want to hear about now. Like, all the need. Understanding yeah. now? Yes, from here through now, yeah. What is about and um because we didn't get the chance or offer us like the service, they didn't give us um um no support. Better understanding yeah. back then. But yeah. So you've got a better understanding now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what mom what mom is saying that um, back then they didn't have any understanding about what what um, NDIS is is about, but now um, because of Boise's condition, uh, um, they had to kind of relearn uh, or learn about the services themselves um, because of yeah no um, um, I guess representation uh, or better understanding um, back then, but they they do now. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the NDIS understands island people? Do you think NDIS understand about island people? Mm. I'm not sure. Do you think they understand island culture? I'm not too sure. Um, do you think they understand where you live back on Thursday Island? No. And why why do you think they don't understand? Oh. Have you yes. seen people on Thursday Island from NDIS before? Yes, I've seen people up there, mm -hmm. yeah, up in TI. And what about now since you've been able to go back home? Have you been able to go into any office? In, on Thursday Island for NDIS? No. Is there an office? Yeah, I think, yeah. So, yeah, so mum doesn't really know, know where the office on the island is. You haven't been there? No. Um, would you be able to tell me how you would get back to the island. So if you were to leave Cairns today, how would you be able to get back to TI? By, by a plane, plane from Cairns to Horn Island, yeah, and from Horn Island, transfer in the bus from the airport down to the wharf for the ferry, cross over to Thursday Island, yeah. And is it possible to have wheelchairs go that journey on the plane and the bus and on the ferry? Yes. Do you think um, it's easy for? Yeah, we still need them ac things accessible for people in wheelchairs. So you need you need more accessibility. Yes. And do you think that that if Boise was to go home today, that you would be <laughs> you would struggle to get him back home because there's no accessibility? Yeah. And what about through the um, Thursday Island? Is it easy to get around town in a wheelchair? Transportation, yes. There's not much um, taxi service with that um, access to, no, yeah. What about the roads? Can someone go on, on the sidewalk or would you have to go on the road on a no, wheelchair? We, we do have um, sidewalk there around the island. Yeah. We check for people with um, wheelchair and that is it easy for them to be? No, not. You reckon really. it's easy for them to? Um, access the footpath on the island or is it too rough for them? 
much. So it, would it be too rough yeah. to go on the footpath? Yeah. Okay. And um, what about your home? Is it on stilts? Yes. I and, see. and what about underneath? Can anyone live there or is that open? Just open downstairs, yeah. Laundry downstairs. And so you would have to carry Boise up the stairs for him to be home. Yeah, or help him up. And so would you need to modify the house to make sure that Boise could access it? Yeah, yes. And why is it important for Boise to come home? Is that where family is? Yeah. Home is where the heart is, family. And it's good he's back home for you. His well being emotionally. And to be around his people? Yeah. And for, for island people, is it important to have that connection to the sea? Yes. And also to be close to his newborn son? Yes. Now, I want to talk about the support services. Um, Boise has since been discharged from the hospital and been living in supported independent living, but he shares that with two other men. Yes. Um, when you were talking as a family together um, about him moving into that accommodation, was it important to you to be able to go to his new home and be spend time with him and cook with him? Was that something that was important to you all? Yes. And did you also want some privacy so that you could be a family together? Yes. And were you concerned that maybe if you were all there and there's two other people that they may... Um, be upset that they don't have family there at the same time. Was that making you worried a bit? Yes. Did you also want to stay overnight? Be able to stay overnight? Like some of boys here. Did you, like, did you just want us to stay? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And that wasn't possible in that accommodation. No. And those are the things that are important in island custom to be able to do for your family that needs help. Yeah. Um, looking to the future, today the big bosses will be listening. What would you want to tell them if you can change things to make life easier for Boise? Service in the Torres Strait to support people with disability, so families. <coughs> um, I don't have to relocate down to Cairns. And, and access public transport like ferry service for people with um, disability yeah, and plans yeah, for family living in the Torres Strait. Mm -hmm. and, um, and number two, the most important one is um, housing, improving housing accessibility ability for people with disability up in the islands and in the Torres Strait and for support to independent living as for boy boy that who wants to go back home. Is it also important that um, 
they understand the NDIS has interpreters or that people can access information in Creole? Just access. Like you think that NDIS should have um, like information in Creole so mm -hmm. it would be more understandable yes, for us? Yes, so, so they can communicate and both will have a better understanding. And do you think that they should big bosses should go to the islands to understand island people and island life? Do you think the big bosses yes. should go up and see how yes. we live up there? So yes. They have a better understanding. Come and observe. Yes. Yeah. And if there are any other island people that might be listening today, do you have any messages for them? No, just to come come forward with your, your request and, and say your story. And so your story may be heard if how people, the Torres Strait Islanders. And are many Torres Strait Islander people very quiet and reserved, so they might not talk up? Mm. Yeah. So, mm. sorry, you go, Bernard. So it's important that other island people talk up. Yes. Uh, Boise, is there anything that you'd like to say? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I'll ask the Commissioners whether they have any questions for you, and I'll start by asking Commissioner Mason if she has any questions for you. <clears throat> um, I just had one question. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, giving your evidence this afternoon. Um, I wanted to know if you have met any workers in the NDIA from the Torres Strait community, anyone that you know works for the NDIA who is from the Torres Strait? No. No. I haven't met anyone. Thank you. Just wanted to know that because we talked about um, communication during today and you've mentioned that again, being able to communicate with people who know uh, your community there is a connection. So I was interested in that question. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say um, that I've been to St. Paul's Village. Mm -hmm. I liked it very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen? Uh, no questions. I want to express my uh, gratitude and appreciation for, for your information and evidence. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to add my thanks to you, uh, Mama Namok, uh, Bernard, Kanisha, and uh, Boise as well. Thank you so much for coming to the Royal Commission and for telling us about Boise's story and your own experiences. Uh, it is very important for us to get stories from uh, people with disability throughout Australia and in a sense, you are representing the uh, Torres Strait Islands because uh, you obviously come from there and we've now heard evidence from uh, people from Thursday Island, yourself. So uh, we're grateful to you for allowing us to hear something of your story and of uh, the Thursday, Thursday Island and uh, to share Boise's story with us. I've been to Thursday Island and I seem to remember that there was a white man who was buried, uh, was it upside down in uh, Thursday Island? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> is, my, is my memory correct? <laughs> Robert Douglas, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much again. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, some of the things that you would like to see come about will come about in due course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank Mr. Argo. Thank you, Commissioners. That concludes the evidence for today. Thank you. Mr. Griffin is threatening to take your place again. Commissioners, thank you to you, Commissioners, and to the support staff for sitting late for the second day. Tomorrow we wish to start at 10 a.m. and we will deal with Fitzroy Valley witnesses all day and all will be by AVL. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I endorse what uh, Mr. Griffin has said. Thank you. It's uh, not unusual for us to go over time, and it does take the uh, commitment and dedication of staff uh, and of uh, the law and order people, the interpreters that enable us to do that. So thank you, everybody. And uh, all I can do, a bit like Churchill, is offer you the opportunity to do the same thing again tomorrow, Thursday, and quite possibly Friday as well. So we'll adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow.